you being you again. And it was really people, when we finally dug into it, people who had a card that wasn't due, you know, or that wasn't being paid on time, they had four or five cards that were being paid on time, right? And a mortgage that wasn't being paid on time. And the reason they didn't call us back is they knew that we had low acceptance. And so if they were down to one card that they could use, they decided it couldn't be us. And they were paying back Visa and MasterCard first, and then we didn't get paid back. Well, that was sort of just a random data point in a meeting, and I'm sure all of us have been to meetings and had that random data point come across, and like, okay, what's that really mean? So it's interesting because you want to learn about how things are interpreted. Now there's analytics in action. I call this analytics in action because I'm not really smart. I'm not that analytical. I, uh, I, I don't struggle with numbers, but I find them a challenge, but I find applying them is actually the most important thing. So that's why I call this analytics in action. And I want to start out with something. My analytics team, they said, hey, use this to start. And who, who ever saw the movie Jaws? What's that quote? Just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water again? This is just when you thought it was safe to turn on the TV again. Oh yeah, we're just watching TV, right? No, while you're watching TV, you're being watched. And I, I put the URL here, I'm not sure if I'm gonna hand out the decks. Every time you do something on Netflix, this is just as analytics in real life, they're actually watching you to the point where they wanna see what you do next. And who's watched lately on Netflix and as soon as one episode ends, another one starts? They realize that if you watched 15 hours of TV on Netflix a month, you were never leaving. Seriously. And so they had this thing like, well, how do we get people to watch more TV? Because they found that out. And then someone said, why don't we just keep it running? Let's let them make the choice. And they found more and more people stopped making that choice. And I don't know about you, but that's sort of how we binge watch House of Cards or anything else. That was an analytical data point. I put all the other things that are up here. They watch, you know, when you rewind, fast forward, they actually saw people would go online and look at, this. I think Amazon did this, look at who was in a movie. Amazon owns IMDB, Internet Movie Database. They said, wow, people would go online after they watch a movie on Prime and see who was in that movie. Well, who's watched anything on Amazon lately like Game of Thrones? In the upper right-hand corner, it tells you who that star is. That's because they saw that behavior in data and then someone applied it. Now. You've listened to me for five minutes, and I thought, well, I better explain myself. I, I'm what I, I call a marketing mongrel, and I think the, the, the street term is mutt. I've, I'm one of these people that, you know, if you're married to someone who's very programmed and organized, what do they want you to do, right? Rise up and be some amazing superstar in a company. Well, I, that wasn't the you know, pot of gold at the end of the hose buying rainbow. I've worked the most anywhere, five years. But I've sort of worked in the sequence of how marketing's changed. I started in advertising at Leo Burnett years ago. Back, uh, Tony the Tiger was big. We had a lot of advertising accounts. Then I went to work in field marketing at Pepsi and Nabisco. So I kind of know what retail's like because we go deal with retailers. In fact, my case at the end of this is about what we did in retail marketing to understand what consumers were doing. I then went to AOL Time Warner. I went to AOL because I thought, well, this looks sort of fun. I didn't really know what they were doing. And I said, you need people who understand marketing? And they were like, oh yeah, we really do. And I go, what do they do? They're like, well, we gotta help our clients market. So as a result, I went down there, I get there my first day, and my boss says, we're gonna go meet Unilever, they're a big client. And he's like, okay, Mark, come with us. You know, he's sort of a weird dude. So, who knows New York City? We're staying down at 18th Street. He goes, let's go see Unilever. They're at 54th in Park. He goes, we'll just walk up. And it was like, you know, September 15th. I was so sweaty when I got there, so I'm sweating. I'm like, well, great, at least I can listen. He goes, hi, I'm Jeff Lee. I work at AOL. This is Mark goes by your new rep here. And he goes, Mark, go ahead. That was literally <laughs> the beginning of my career. He said, well, I worked at Time Warner. I've had Lou Dobbs yell at me. This is when you can't teach people to market despite themselves. I can tell you that if they have any questions. And then I went to Accenture about four years ago and they needed someone to kind of translate what they were doing in digital services to their clients and the rest of the organization. I work in the operations group. Now the code word for that is it's outsourcing. Most of the people that I work with and colleagues work in Bratislava, Warsaw, a chunk in India. But in marketing, so much of what has to get done is so hard to get done that marketers are distracted by it and can't get it done. And so that's what we do for them. That was a lot in one sentence. And so I figured rather than do a slide about myself, I just Google myself. You should do that once in a while. I think they got it most right. You can see the most important thing in my life apparently according to Google 
is my wife. I don't know how they know that, but that's pretty amazing that after 25 years, that's the third thing that comes up in the search. Obviously, she pays for that keyword. So, when I mean, you think about marketing, marketing really is about math, right? So analytics applies. There's really three versions of math in marketing. Customer math, find more customers, get more from them, or get them to buy more often. It's not that hard, right? Then there's the business math. If, if you're the business person running a business, you're like, okay, what is the percent of people who buy? What's the percent, that, how often do they buy, and how much do they buy versus competition? Very simple numbers. Then the last one is budget math. Do more with same, do same for less, or do more with less. So that's essentially what happens in the day of life of a marketer back in version 1.0. So this is actually what marketing was like when I first started. There was a focus on reporting. Like you had these nice people. They were usually people who started to decide to get off the track and be in analytics and reporting. And they'd read these reports all the time. And you'd go by their desk and they were really busy. And you're like, wow, I hope, I hope you're not staying too late, et cetera. But there was this real belief in skill over data. And see those shiny, happy people in the middle? That's what a marketing meeting was like. Like these really good looking people talking about fun stuff with packaging around them. And so you believe they just had this inherent marketing ability. They were great marketers. And you didn't know what that meant, but you, you really couldn't challenge them on it. And they trusted their suppliers. That's the uh, commercial being you know, shot in an ad agency. And so they would say, the agency knows what they're doing. And you'd sit there, and you'd, you'd approve a TV commercial that said, OK, we're going to have the box in front. People are going to pour cereal out of the box. They're going to eat it, smile, and then they're going to say the name of the brand. And the agency would say, yeah, that's a great ad. Then they'd come back, and they're like, it would start in a rock. Then you'd see a picture of the sun. And then you'd see this empty refrigerator. Then you'd see the box maybe sideways. And then you'd see this family like pulling away in a car. They go, what happened to the regular commercial? No, we took some creative license on the set. This is, this is much better. And then, then the boss, who always got taken to the golf tournaments by the agency, would be like, OK, I think they're right. And you put the ad on TV, and nothing would happen. And then after six months, they go, you know what, maybe that wasn't the right approach. But they had this huge trust in suppliers. The consumer did the same thing every day. They'd watch TV, they'd go to the store and send their kids to school, and then they'd retire at 65. And yes, then there was more people doing reporting. So all that would happen. So remember I said marketing was about math? There wasn't really a lot of math involved back then. It was just that. It was just like hanging out. So if you fast forward to today, what's changed in marketing? These are phrases that I think we picked up and I pulled from a deck. Democratization of data, data sources, data analytics. What's, what's common about what's changed? It's the data, stupid. That's suddenly become the currency in marketing. That's all people talk about in marketing. And frankly, when you go into the world of old school marketing and people, and you'll talk about this, Scott, people who can't evolve at the agency, they're kind of like hanging out, you know, doing interesting jobs on small accounts because the, the way marketing works now is much more data driven. People talk about big data, and so what's the big deal about the big data? And you may even go with this when you talk about the mind church chat. It's very complex, multiple sources, detailed information, unrelated formats. So much of what you can observe in life doesn't come in a common package. You know, a bus just drove by, there's probably a GPS on that. He's probably, you know, taking someone to school who's gonna get grades, and he's probably gonna then go home and buy some of the grocery store. All those data points could be relevant to someone who sells beer. They have to figure out how to put all that together in a common format. So it's not just there's many sources, it's very detailed and it's very unrelated. The frequency of data, um, when I started in marketing, and probably a lot of us even sort of remember this, comes in about, used to come in about once a month. You'd wait at the end of the month for the data to come in and you'd say, okay, well, how was last month's data? So you're looking at something that was three weeks after the month closed that was about some seven weeks ago. And all of a sudden, that's changed. You get real-time data, obviously, all the time. And then the other thing about marketing people, now that they're so anxious about data, they're spending all this time like wanting to know right away. And in fact, I talked to someone at the Rutgers School, and she said, the problem with marketing now is they're so data-driven, they've kind of forgot about customer experience. And as a result, you know, this always needing to know data is critical. And then the last thing is the volume of it. Sales, third-party databases, and touch points. All those things make big data very complicated, but they're all pretty useless unless you do one thing, and that's you know how do you use it to make decisions? How do you figure out how to use all this data to figure out what to sell, you know, what to say, who to say it to, and then how much to charge? The biggest problem with analytics 
is that they produce stuff that isn't really used to make a decision. And at the end of the talk, and I'm sure you'll probably you know, mention this too, you've gotta to be close to the clients in analytics, not close to the machine. Because so much of what happens is, and I had a team that was doing some analytics, they had an amazing insight for this auto manufacturer. They said, hey, we found out a great correlation between people who buy you know, small cars. We go, what's that? They go, they own a small car today. Wow, they go, yeah, we crunched the numbers. It's an amazing analysis. I'm like, but that's not really like an insight. That's an obvious, that's keen grasp of the obvious. They're like, oh no. And so if they talk to the client, they'd say, what we really need to know is X, but that wasn't happening. So as I said at the end, I'll say analytics is a context sport. So you fast forward to marketing today. I was thinking about this, and I'd be curious about some other people's opinion. Why is analytics so big? What I described sounds hard, kind of annoying, and, and even to the point of like, really, what's the point? And anybody who's been in marketing maybe 15 plus years has some experience in it? I mean, I'll say this, but I'd be interested in your opinion as well. I, when I thought about this, all this data unlocks hidden value. That's what our clients are seeing, is that there's something I didn't know, that now that I know, I can get more out of the customer. So if you think about it, you can say new and better messages. It used to be very challenging to figure out what to say, so you resolve on kind of one common approach. Well, you know what, we're gonna tell them, this cereal is good for you because it goes great with orange juice. Now there's so many things you can say based on what you can find out about people that you can actually you know, talk about much more interested and relevant messaging. You have unknown groups within consumers. We had a client, they had two segments. They were a telco company and they had people who had 20 employees and people who had less than 20 employees. And that was their segmentation. They gave us the analytics and they said, wow, there's so much more I can get out of this. And they found tons of what they called micro segments. They didn't know they were there until they looked at the data. Innovative approaches to connecting with people. I think mobile is the most inventive one. The ability to tell someone in front of a car dealer that there's a sale today. If you can use data to do that, when's Mark driving by on his cell phone? Has he been to our website? By the way, tell him Toyota's on sale today. That's unlocked value because that person would have just been driving by. So all of this should be aimed at how do I find more value in my customers? And then you think about, well, what's the concept? What was the concept? Remember the marketing 1.0 is now a number. Pillsbury Doughboy was like the most famous thing in marketing. He was cute, he was mocked. I think the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man was kind of a bad rip off of him in, um, in Ghostbusters. Now it's about hyper loyal users. You know, teach the world the same was a famous ad. Now it's about effective frequency. So everything now, what used to be a concept in marketing is now, okay, what's the number behind it? I'm gonna stop for a sec, because this is always better when it's interactive. Any interactions or observations on that or personal experience to share? Nine out of 10, sound true? Eight, maybe? No, I'm in marketing, so part of it's not true. But. <laughs> so I'm gonna use the rest of the talk to go through three things, or six things, actually, but I'll, I'll keep them quick. One is a case study about how we dug deeper in a retail analytics environment. The second is a case study about a way people are putting data together in new approaches. And the last one is a case study, which I think is really important to do, about someone who overanalyzed something and didn't actually think about what they were doing. A couple of thoughts on, you know, what are the trends? a couple things in terms of what's going on in the ecosystem and then the big finish with Q&A. So that'll be the next 40 minutes. Does that, that work? Great. So the first thing is, I want to give you the sense of how analytics was put into play in a grocery store. You know, I talked about the trends in data, big data. Grocery probably has more data that's useful than almost any other industry. Anybody here in the grocery business? I mean, would you say that's an accurate statement? I went, I went to Stop and Shop, which is up in Boston, and this was in uh, you know, 1994. I always just sort of date myself by saying during the, Carter, during the Clinton administration, because that kind of doesn't make me completely old, because it could be the end of it or the beginning, but during the Clinton administration, we went to Stop and Shop, and we said, hey, you, know, you guys have all this data. Can you process it? And they said, yeah, we have cookie and cracker data down to every user. And I go, what about like the SKU level? They go, no way, I can ever tell you SKU. They had that data, they couldn't process it. That's changed a lot now. So now grocers, and we're working with a grocer in France who's gonna give us SKU data 
by user every day in a real-time way to do analytics for ad serving. Think of all the data that they have. Well, this is a grocer who had the same issue, and, and they realized, surprisingly, and I can't tell you who this is, but you might be able to guess, and I'm not going to stop you, these people were losing business. It, it's the one that is very sexy, that you know, it talks about how they're high priced, but one of the issues was is they were kind of losing customer traffic. People, the store didn't change. They actually were really a good grocery store. The food was even better than ever, but for some reason, their business was slipping. And they said, what are we gonna do to fix it? So I'll give you some context of them and then how they fix it. And they fixed it because of data. They didn't change the way the store was laid out, the classic sort of store trick, go in and read merchandise. They didn't throw samplers on the floor to buy expensive stuff. They looked at the data, but they looked in a very sort of linear way. $15 billion, 400 stores, very product-focused marketing. Come in and buy this, come in and buy that. I love this word, degrowth. That's a marketing word. We are, we are losing business. We're just degrowing. I mean, that's like I'm, I'm getting, you know, my salary is degrowing. Or, I mean, who would ever say that? But apparently, uh, someone in marketing spun it up here. They wanted to figure out a customer-centric marketing program. And, and the thing about it was, how do we take what we do, understand our customers better, and then apply it so that we can actually market to them? The other thing about marketing here is they weren't going to turn on TV advertising. They didn't say, oh, come visit the store more. We're new and different. They said, we've got to use a data-driven approach, not kind of a positioning and marketing one. You, you can see the results, and we'll talk about those at the end. They were able to, through this program, and again, this is just a, a, a very linear but systematic approach about how data was applied, and I want to walk you through that, actually make a big difference in their business to the point where if you're buying groceries, you know, there's always things you want to buy. They found a way to make the right suggestions to the right people at the right time, and they drove, I think, a, an 18% lift over if they hadn't done that, which in their business, given the scale on $15 billion, is huge. Yep, I'll go back. I'm going to walk you through a variety of slides. Uh, the back button is there. Great. Go back and forth. Great. So I took this from an Accenture um, presentation, so sorry about the change in fonts and stuff. But there are four steps that they went through. One is they organized the data in what they call a customer loyalty analytics record. Anybody in our business has to say, okay, so how do you take all this data and organize it? And you place a bet that says, there's probably 400 fields that really count. And then you take all the data and you put it in those fields and you find out what's missing. And a field is essentially a column on an Excel spreadsheet. They maintaining that over 200 attributes per shopper. So they had to, first of all, pull the data together then they had to do some segmentation. Okay, what is all this telling us? How do we offer things, and how do we do things that are customized? How do we measure it, and then how do we monitor it or find it? So if you think of an analytics process, I just put this here because it may not be as obvious. You don't jump and say, oh my God, what do we do right now? Let's, let's give them new offers. You know, I think the marketing team would say, why don't we give people offers for orange juice with cereal? That's great, makes a lot of sense. And in the old days, you probably would have brainstormed out offers, right? They had, I think I'll see it in a slide a little bit later, an insane amount of offers. It wasn't about finding new offers, it was about finding the way to give it to people who it was more appropriate. And just go through the first thing. I, I put this here because I want to give someone a sense of what's in an analytic record for a customer. Because the obvious thing would be what they buy, right? Well, you always start out with gender, okay, with demographics. And, and they may not even be relevant. I mean, this room is obvious. There's probably some very common demographics here. Who else was born um, in the Kennedy administration? How about the Eisenhower administration? I was born when Eisenhower was president because he was 60 and he hadn't been elected yet. Kennedy had billion. So th th that makes, you know, that doesn't, now who's been born in the uh, Johnson administration? All right, demographically similar, probably not anything else other than that. If you think about who's been born when, Car when uh, Clinton was president? Well, I'm not getting it right here, but anyway. They're, they're, well, you guys are very quiet. I don't know which one it is. But you can see that's a common one, but it doesn't really make any difference. Shopping habits. When do they shop? This is interesting. This is behavioral data. This explains who someone is. This explains who, what they do. You always want behavioral data because people will tell you stuff before they actually do something. They will tell you one thing and do another. Everybody in, in sort of... Business knows that, especially in research. So you have to be very clear about what they're doing. Then you look at 
their history point of sale data. This is what makes grocery business so rich in analytics is that they have this POS data. Every time you scan something, it creates a data point. And it's really interesting. We found for one retailer up in Canada, the thing that made their circular most effective is when they advertised chicken. For some reason, the POS data said, hey, we found a correlation between advertising of chicken and store traffic. They never would have known that, but the analytics told them that. Then there's campaign. This is sort of classically where the marketers would have started. Let's do something before we think. Let's just spend time sending out emails. Who gets the emails that are unthought? Everybody gets those, right? You know, try this, try that. You have to, well, you don't really know me, so I'm not gonna respond. And then they found a way to actually put it in action in someone's email and app. All those data points, they knew about their customers. And they didn't know which one was gonna say anything, but they said, we have to collect it and normalize it. The next thing they did was they put segments together. And, and they looked at not just two segments of, you know, high value people and low value people, they broke it into a range of groups and they talked about how much they spent and how often they came. The data told them those are the two variables, when they shop and then what they buy. And then we put together segments around, you know, these are just four examples, high value families, high value couples, supplement shoppers. You know, these folks want very different offers than those groups. And you could talk about, based on some of the data, you know, they're interested in bakery products, prepared foods, they found out what they bought. So there's all that POS data in action. You then, as a marketer, this is where you'd be spending your time, not crunching the numbers. What's the strategy? Retain footfall, which means get them to the store more often. Increase weekly date traffic on weekdays. Much more granular than you ever could have done. And the reason it's so granular is you can actually act on that. If someone, I want them to come during the week, when do I give them the coupon? Sunday night, right? Uh, Century 21 said their most traffic to their website was what day do you think? Century 21 is a real estate agent. When do you think they saw the most traffic to their websites? Sunday. Sunday. You drive around yourself, you're like, I cannot do this alone. I gotta find an agent. The first trip was always the FISBO, for sale by owner. You go there, you go to the open house, like, oh my God, we don't understand this town at all. That's when they would get all the requests was Sunday night because people would be like, you know what? This isn't a, a journey I can take on my own. And then you design the offers to do that. So th this again, probably not necessarily rocket science thinking, but the ability to do this and the discipline to do this is the only way they knew they were gonna grow their business. And this is the thing that I think was interesting is, you know, client wants to design a loyalty program, they wanna get 200,000 people in, they're gonna start with 11 stores to test it. Everybody wants to test something first. They always wanna pilot something. And that makes sense, because you gotta modify it. When they looked at those stores, they said, wow, there are 8,000 available offers in those stores. They looked at every price off, every kind of special, within just 11 stores. And they said, well, we can't give, can you imagine the register tape with 8,000, who's been to CVS and is part of their rewards program? You get those things that spit out. Imagine with 8,000 offers spit out at this store when you got it, you'd be like, okay, can we order pizza now? They, they had 8,000 offers to choose from. And they realized one thing, they can't choose them themselves. I will never get this right. So then they said, okay, so what are the potential offers retained that you know, make sense? Retain the best offers based on the ones that are used. Relevant offers matched to customers. Top 10 uniquely matched offers rendered to customers. That means every customer got, of that 8,000, a permutation of 10 offers. So if you think of the shoppers, 200,000 shoppers, you divide that by 10, it's 20,000. They had 20,000 different sets of offers that would go to people, all based on what they were doing. It wasn't one to one. It wasn't, oh, Mark, by the way, you bought Crest, you know, buy some more Crest. But they really thought through and were able to, thanks to the analytics, match all their offers. Remember, no creating new offers, only just providing new offers to the right people and then giving it to those folks. And that's what drove the lift in their business. The hardest thing about this program is it's hard to scale. You can do this with 200, you know, thousand customers. You can do it with like 300 stores. Doing this chain wide, there's a, a retailer in Europe who's gonna do this, takes a huge database and a partner and a really sophisticated algorithm. But again, if you think through this, figure out the data, figure out the analytics, work with new offers and then track it and then obviously deliver it when they get to the store. Only through apps and emails could you understand, okay, Mark Hosebine's going to the store, we'll send him the email and you'll get a purchase frequency. The biggest challenge about grocery loyalty programs up until this, does anybody have a, 
who knows sort of the ultimate challenge of, we just talked about grossly loyalty program and before digital activity, what was the biggest issue you had with kind of driving value to your customers? When was the only time you actually told the grocery store who you were in, a, in the old days, before they got emails and apps? Pardon? At payment, yeah. Oh, by the way, Mark, go back to aisle three. We think there's something on sale you would like. No, that's not gonna happen, right? What about next time? Well, you know what, I don't know what that's gonna be. Thanks to digital technology, grocers can now deliver value and offers to people in advance. And that changed the potential for their whole business and marketing. Because in the end, you know, they only told you at the very end and that by then the offers are useless. Here's how we measure this. We looked at, this is a, and Cove is a, a analytical method. We looked at the sales lift per spend, and we did a test and control, and you could see across every category, and this was something, something you used to be able to see in marketing. You saw a lift in the ability to, to claim rate and redemption rate. I claim the offer, which means, yeah, that makes sense to me, and then I redeem it. So the, the operative number is are these two, which means how right did I get? Half the people that saw this used it. More than half on that one. A little less than 40%. You know, this one we had to figure out, itemizers. But that kind of look at the data, think of all the data points that's generated, that was the real telling data because what could I, what was I giving people then what were they using? And you want these two numbers to be pretty close to one another, right? That was an analytics exercise that took us a long time to get to because we didn't know quite how to look at the results and it took us a while to get there. But it made a tremendous difference in their business. Again, the challenge is scaling it and then the challenge with any of these things is, you know, how do you make sure there's someone in marketing or someone in the company who's a champion of this? Because so often many people will be like, all right, that's a great idea, but I got a better one. So the biggest challenge with analytics is that there's so many numbers people can look at it very differently. Any questions on that one? Go ahead. I always took grocery stores or those kind of chain guys being very driven by the product manufacturing, right? Product placement things in stores, those kinds of things. How much has the shift taken with this kind of analytics, moving the data points away from the manufacturers driving your marketing campaigns it, 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 to your data driving your own campaigns? It's so challenging because the revenue from, right, from those stores, Best Buy is an example. I'm doing a program with a, a retailer in Brazil, Via Viejo, which is their basically their low-end Best Buy. It's Best Buy for the common man in Brazil. And we've got this essentially the same kind of program we can apply. And they're like, well, we gotta talk to the merchandising people about it. Because the merchandisers want Samsung refrigerators on sale on Thursday. And you know they're gonna give them a boatload of money to do that. And I think they haven't resolved how to do that. This is, a manuf this is a grocery store that wasn't beholden to manufacturers. So it's a little bit about the potential of non sort of incumbents to be disrupted. Because if I'm Stop and Shop or I'm Acme, I, I'm swearing by all the cash I get from Pepsi and Nabisco. And if I'm this chain, I don't play that game as much so I can do this. I think we're going to begin to work with Albertsons out west because they realize that strategy hasn't been working as well for them. And it's not just this industry either because I'm in the computer business and a lot of our marketing is driven by manufacturing. It's driven by the IBM programs, the HP programs, the Microsofts, the, all those guys are saying, we do the analytics, this is what you should be doing. You know, where we've seen people succeed in your role is pushing back on quality of leads. Say, hey, you send me all these people. I got my sales people burning time, calling all these leads that I get that are completely unqualified, there's no intelligence. Then they'll begin to listen because then that pushes back on their marketing folks to say, let's do a better lead gen program. But it's very hard to kind of break that cycle, especially for incumbents. I mean, I think we wrestle with that all the time. Someone else had a question? So not not all of the people use offers, obviously. There are people who are too busy to cut coupons or yeah. use apps or whatever. Um, so do you know the percentage of the people who use offers and who don't? And how do you approach the ones who don't? You know, I have to go back and ask the folks about that one because I think they got, if you go back to this page, this says there's 32% of the people, which is extraordinarily high, who opened up and looked at the offer at about 15%. What they've done for the other people is generally try to do look-alike modeling and, and keep giving them offers to understand, okay, maybe there's a trigger that's gonna get them. I know in other organizations, what they'll do is try to do more messages around recipe, et cetera. But I think 
that was the point I raised about the Rikers professor. Markers are so obsessed with this stuff that they aren't thinking about other ways to do that now. And that's where the Netflix example is a bit better because they don't do anything in Netflix to give you offers. I've never seen, a, oh, if you sign up for two months now, you get 30% off. But they'll do things that are behavioral. So in this business, it is tough because it's hard to affect behavior because you're kind of walking through the store. In Netflix, they'll, they'll actually make the experience better. And so where there are people, in retail it's hard to do, especially in terrestrial retail. But in things where you can create the experience, they'll use the data to manage the experience so it feels more personal. And if you sell only with offers, you cut your, you cut your revenue. Like people expect offers and then they don't buy when you don't have an offer. Well, and it, it, if it's sort of, the, the offers here, you know, kind of play back to the segments. We know what they want. They weren't offers that were unwelcome. We knew these people, you know, they were under indexing a bakery. But if we gave them bakery stuff, they were likely to use it. So it wasn't like, okay, I'm going to promote it. It was generally less about what they bought and more about areas to stretch them in buying. So all these offers were not price off. They were things that based on what they knew they liked or other people like them used, said, oh yeah, by the way, the host buyers probably should be getting a cake once in a while. And so it was much more done on adding value than reducing price. Okay. And so that, and, and they, they only could be confident about that because of the size of the database, because they could look at this huge set of data and say, you know what, here's a segment that should be buying cake that isn't, and not because cakes are free, but because it's sort of suggestive selling. So it's almost like someone in the aisle saying, hey, by the way, check out the bakery. So it was more welcome, and that's why it was more effectively redeemed. What other questions on that one? I, I think, you know, from our business at Accenture, there is so much to do to unlock grocery, but the point you raised, it's such a traditional industry and it's so much under siege that I think we're having a hard time finding an enlightened one that said, you know, let's try this. This is obviously a big chain, but not the biggest chain. I think in Europe, there's more inventiveness in, in some of the chains and a little bit more confidence. But I think also the, the purchase of, I guess, Amazon bought Whole Foods is we think it'll wake up grocery and say, you know, you've got a lot of data, you've got to go and break the mold. How do you do that? Who knows who these two guys are? Anybody? I didn't know either, so I mean, I'm not giving you any hard time. It's, it's Watson and Crick. The, who knows who Watson and Crick are? The guys who invented the, the, the gene. Well, they didn't invent it, obviously. God invented it, if that's what you Well, we're here to know, I have to say that, right? So. <laughs> But the idea of a genome is this individualized footprint that is just about you. And, and the thing about genetics that I've always found so fascinating is 48 combinations of DNA, whatever those chromosomes are, actually make me who I am. And I don't know how math works necessarily, as I said early on, but that idea of being able to take, you know, not a huge set of numbers and combine them to create an amazing insight about that's exactly how Mark Hosbein is. We took that same approach and applied it to analytics and created something called the, the Accenture Customer Genome. And I wanted to give you this because it just shows you the layer of information and not that you, know, you add more data and it just gets more complicated. If you add more data, you add these multiple levels of insights. We, we started, and I think everybody in data starts, you, know, you start trying to decompose what people are doing with the customer by understanding individual's uniqueness. You, you ultimately want to get to Personalization. I was with a, a friend of mine, this is 15 years ago, and he goes, you know, it's going to jump up one day on a banner and say, hi, are you Don Durbin? And we all laughed about that. But who's gotten a banner that said, oh my God, those guys really know me? Who, who's, had a, who's had a spooky experience lately? Like you were doing one thing and then it said, do another. Did you have an experience online where they actually knew you? I feel like they were guessing like the chances. They were guessing? Good guess, bad guess? Very good guess. Good guess. What was it? I'm just curious. So you're obviously, they may even know you're checking in like at a yoga place or something. And they're like, oh yeah, how about other workout studios? Someone's thought through that whole process to make it very personalized. I, I think I was coming down here because I booked a Marriott and it talked to me about restaurants in Philadelphia. I'm like, how spooky is that? But in the end, I think we all pretty much accept it, right? It's gonna happen and they're not ill-intentioned you know, they're maybe not as forthcoming because there's probably a lot more stuff they know about you. How many people have two phones for work that, that work? 
the personal one, and then the one the company has everything you do on it. They, they actually, they're always watching you. So we said, well, how do you watch what's going on with people in a way that's you know, more than just obvious? And so we created this concept of the digital genome where you took the product DNA, what's everything about that product? Don't just say it's a chainsaw. Say it's a chainsaw with all these attributes, and I'll show you an example. So this is the one we did for a tool company. Get everything you can about that, then look at the customer and see if you can figure out not who they are, but what they do. So on the product level, we took all the information about the product, but versus going down the demographic route, we took the behavioral data and talked about what people did. Because we were trying to uncover what the motivation of someone was and what were the data points that were not so obvious. And then we find a way to bring that to experience. This is always the thing. These first two steps, I think you probably could have done. You could always have done this. You could maybe have done this interaction-wise you know, two or three years ago. This idea of creating an experience around it is now what's possible because you can do individualized ad serving. You can find a way to do dynamic content. There's a company that when you watch an ad online, they build that ad for you milliseconds before you see it. They said, pull these three things in because that's actually what Mark is interested in. It's called flash talking. You may, you may have known of them. It's a dynamic ad server. They're, everyone wants to sort of build things right for you in real time. This is the platform that enabled it. You took, I'm gonna get, this is sort of boring analytics stuff, but you said, okay, how do you integrate everything? How do you then understand about the customer? And then how do you create a library underneath it? And I, I'm not gonna drain this stuff. That's, that's our word for going through the whole presentation. You don't wanna drain the slide. But you have to take a thinking that says, I need to put it together. I need to understand what the customer's doing. And then I need to understand how that relates to the product. What that does, I think this is a fancy one that moves around when you click it. It did it at least when I looked at my own computer. So, you, oh, there it goes. Yeah, that's just to see if you guys are awake too, so I want to be sure that worked. You know, here's sort of what you could do with two months of effort, three to four hundred sort of solutions evaluated. You sort of run through a macro on your machine. You kind of get, well, there's a couple segments in the middle and then, you know, obscure segments here. When you look at the, the customer genome, what it did is it gave you a lot more variables that were unexpected. You know, Mark had looked at a travel site before he went to a shoe site, and that's where some of those insights come. Hey, maybe Mark's going on a walking trip. Maybe his motivation for travel isn't that he's going on a business trip, but he's exercising. And so those variables were put into this, and it created a lot more different you know, opportunities, and then it provided a lot different, much more differentiation in segments, and therefore, from this customer's point of view, value. So they find my customer demos and shopping preferences to avoid bias. So, you know, we made this a very simple exercise. I'm just, you know, again, walking through the toolkit, you can sort of see here's the features you put in. You have to do much more sort of data mat mashing to get all those tied to your customer record. And then you look at the features, the tech specs, and you take all that information and you create sort of a, you know, as I said, the DNA. All those things create a much richer profile and then you look at the individual, all these interactions that they did. How do those features correlate to interactions? And you find out a way to percolate the two or three things that make a difference. And the, the difference here is, this is all very interesting to do, but it's actually much more actionable than it used to be able to be. So, and then, then the, the, as I said, the, the most challenging part is, how do you then bring that to life in the market? That's where you know the ability to kind of man manage analytics as well as digital activity. And that's actually what most companies are struggling with now is, how do you take all of this stuff I know and then put it to use? Now I'm going to give you my favorite example of analytics overall. This is, I don't know, I, this actually happened uh, a long time ago. And it's sort of a quiz. I talked about being in the grocery business, right? I worked in grocery for a long time because I worked for manufacturers who, to your point, we were always banging on the grocery like, okay, can you sell more of our stuff? Put up displays and all. So if you look at it, you know, if you're one of these companies, you either sell in the aisle or you, you put stuff around the store, right? You say, well, we're gonna put the display over by, you know, aisle three. Who's walked into a grocery store? There's that huge display of Pepsi, right? You bought something off it. And so we looked at the grocery store and said, wow, we've got a display in the store. But what if we put three more displays? Would that equal three more time sales, right? We sell a boatload off a display. Why don't we essentially just build displays all over the store? Who thinks that makes sense at face value? I, who, who can see themselves in a meeting Young whippersnapper brand manager saying, I got a great idea. I did this analysis, the display is really great. Let's put three around the store. Who's been in a meeting like that? 
All right, who said that? I mean, I have. Like, oh wow, three more displays this is great. Our marketers are so smart. You know, you're gonna be president of the company one day. Okay, great. So they go out and they say, well, we better do something about that. We better see what happens in the store first because the retailer is gonna be like, that makes no sense at all. You know, you can only sell so much Pepsi. So two companies did something. One, what do you think they're doing on the left hand side? Remember I said behavioral data? They watched what people did. And they had cameras in stores above every point of activity in their product, and they watched people go up and down the aisle and buy it. So, uh, oh, they get, you know, we know people that pull the box out twice actually bought versus people who pull it out three times. Like, oh, amazing, you know. Then they put it in the front box, please pull the box, you know, take a look at the back of the box. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. They watched what people did. It was amazing, you know, hours of footage, almost a, you know, a mini series of footage. The people on the left hand, on the right hand side, what did they do? They just walked around with shoppers. Said, hey, do you mind if I shop with you today? So they're walking around, and they're talking to people, buying stuff. They go, wait, what are you doing here? What are you doing there? And they said, well, I'm doing this, I need that. And, and they essentially tried to do the same thing, but they walked around with the shoppers versus watched them. Who do you think got the answer right? What? The observers? Why? They weren't biased. Totally right answer. The observer, you know, you're walking with someone that, why are you buying? Well, you know, I love shopping. It's really great. Because they're talking to someone who wants to hear about them, right? They will tell you what you want to hear, right? What else? Who else has a thought? More data. Pardon? More data. Yeah, totally. If you're watching people, think of, like I said, it's, it's a basically a mini-series. Oh, yeah, let's go back in and see people who bought Oreos. Did they buy other crackers? Oh, they did. This is genius. You know, let's throw it together made a 3% difference in Nabisco's business. Pepsi actually talked to people. Pepsi, much more out there, fun company. They talked to people. Remember I said, this was the store? They used to follow someone in the whole store, and they talked to them the entire trip. And they didn't do it with one people, they did it with a bunch of people. And I'm gonna give you a clue. They said, you know, one thing we found out, this was Giant Foods down in Baltimore. Like, we talked to a lot of your shoppers. Half of them only come here for lunch. They're like, oh my God, really? No wonder the express lane is so crowded at lunchtime. I never knew that. They found out not what they were doing, but why they were there, because they were going there to buy lunch. Remember the salad bars and stuff? They said, geez, we, we understand why they're so crowded. And they said, and, and you know what? We found out why people come in like Saturday mornings. Well, yeah, stock up, right. You know, you know who comes to the store on a Saturday is fucking crowded. I can't believe it. And they're like, no, no, no. Sorry, I didn't swear, but I am from New York, so whatever. I watched the Surprise <laughs> as a child. So, but I've also imitated the grocery guy, you know, that's what, that's what grocery guys talk sometimes. So anyway, they're sitting there and they're like, no, people come in because they just invited someone over for lunch and they forgot that he didn't have soda. And they said, oh my God, no wonder people always buy two liters by the salad section. And so watching people in Nabisco found two or three percentage points of growth by, you know, putting, essentially pull the box out, look at the back, you know, okay, make them do that, promote Oreos and crackers together. Pepsi reinvented their business because they created something called the Express Lane Merchandiser. They said, you know what? There's three reasons people shop. People go buy off the display, right? So if I'm gonna buy off the display and I want a 24 pack for $5.99, I'm gonna find it because I'm one of those buyers and I'm buying soda for the week. But people who went back to the salad aisle were just buying for a party. And if Pepsi was right there, like, you know what? I probably need some Pepsi. And then they said, you know what? People who are walking through the, the front of the store are there because they're basically using the grocery store like a C store. That was the insight. Grocery stores were no longer grocery stores, they were C stores. And they found that out by talking to people. Nabisco never figured that out, but they figured it out like five years later and finally started putting Oreos in packaging that looked like candy bars. Pepsi said, why, why even tell people to do this? We'll just put coolers up front and it changed their business. This, this bottle of, of Coke here, because Coke and Pepsi kind of have to work together, they make as much money on that bottle of Coke there as they do on a case sometimes. So imagine if you think about that opportunity, not volume, but profit. And then you think about soft drinks. What's the one thing about a soft drink when you drink it, when you buy it, I mean? You generally drink it in a size like that. So you're not cutting into your case sales. It's, it was so incremental, it was unbelievable. And it didn't even get the guys at 7-Eleven mad because it's like, okay, when you put it into the grocery store lane and you're in the grocery store and you're buying soda and you're using it as a luncheon, you know, to buy a soft drink when you go through, you probably price it at a buck nineteen, right? Or today you would. 7-Eleven's always 
very cheap. So it kind of made 7-Eleven look more competitive. So like, yeah, go ahead and do it because it gets them drinking more Pepsi and actually makes our price point look better because groceries were never going to price it like 7-Elevens because they didn't have the volume. It just changed their business. This was in the early 90s and it was all because when they did the analysis, they didn't overthink it. They actually listened a little bit before they just dug into the data. So if you step back, a couple things before we wrap up. Analytics is a context sport. I said that early on. You have to be with the users and the consumers of the data. You can't sit there and, you know, and I'm in the outsourcing business and we send a lot of stuff over to India to get cranked away and taken a look at and they send stuff back and we've realized we've got to put more people sort of close to the customer, not just the crunching. The crunching is great and you can find great insights, but unless you know how to apply it, it's not going to be effective. The second thing is, there's really a business opportunity in it right now, and that's data aggregators. There was a guy I used to work with at AOL, and AOL, I got there when it was doing well, but then it actually started doing kind of poorly. And so we had, uh, it was May 20th, I remember that because my wife's birthday, we had the events of 520, where I was down in Dulles on 519, I get the call, Mark, you need to come to New York this afternoon. And I go, well, I've got some meetings. So you be here this afternoon, and we went through the list and we found people that, you know, we needed to do this. We whacked like 80 people. And we did it so poorly, by the way, that one guy we whacked, we sent him home on the train to Long Island, and somebody was so mad that we sent this guy, we fired this guy, when he got home, there was a message on his phone that said, well, actually, that was a mistake. We didn't mean to fire you. I mean, it was just, it was chaotic. Well, one of the guys we whacked was a guy named Scott East, and he goes, you know what? This is the best thing ever happened to me. He goes, I took my package, and I started a company called M-Sites, which basically aggregates data for marketers. And it's now a $4 million company, he's got 40 employees. He basically takes all this marketing data, and he does visualization and low budget analytics on it. And it's a services business. And it's, you know, this idea of aggregating data and the data food chain is so interesting now because there's so many places to be in it. And then data suppliers need to step up. That's the other issue. The data suppliers, classically, were really reverent of their data. Who's one of the most famous data suppliers in the world? Nielsen. Yeah. Because they, you know what they call their data? This is how arrogant they are. They believe their data is the currency of the industry. Now, who creates a currency, right? Sovereign governments, and by the way, Nielsen. Oh, we're the industry currency. Well, their currency is based on 56,000 people who are pretty closely watched in their home about what they do. But the industry is like, we don't need a currency, we need answers. And IRI has begun to step up and said, you know what, we're gonna be more innovative. So a supplier who has this gold data needs to begin to rethink about how they use it, and, and the data might even be a freemium. We'll give them the data for free and all the applications are separate. As I mentioned, Nielsen, and then this idea that, that we found in research, the closer you put insights to the front line, the more you can do something called just-in-time marketing, which is like, okay, by the way, they need to know this now, can we apply it? So that's just the concept that we're beginning to experiment with. So that's the end of the talk. I think I ended a little bit late, but I, well, I'm actually pretty much on time. We got 10 minutes for questions. Um, I, I appreciate your attention. Anything on that material that you had questions on or just general questions, I'd be glad to take a few minutes to answer. Go ahead. How much have you seen movement on conviction AI before? Like emotion-based? It's been- sentiments, I see more of emotion. You know, I, I mean, I don't think we've seen anybody screw around with that. I was gonna ask my friends in AI, but I think that's actually an interesting one. It'd be interesting to how you capture emotion You'd have to find some way of saying, you know what, when you're happy, you watch this TV show. When you're sad, you do this on search. We're using social media to have a certain algorithm. You know, I, I haven't seen anybody use it for emotions. I did have a client ask me, could they use social media for sentiment about the environment? So a large oil company said, you know, we want to understand social media, not because do people like our gas prices, but what about legislation and where are hotbeds of issues that we need to be aware of as we try to drive our strategy and our legislation? So I think it's better for probably public emotion than it is for private emotion, at least that I've seen. But again, that, that's an interesting point and someone's probably thinking about it somewhere, probably maybe in our world, and you might even know this based on some of the stuff you're gonna talk about, Mark. Great. Other questions? Go ahead. About cameras and um being used in stores, like uh, how how actively are they used? I talked to someone the other day at um, not cameras, but they're using beacons on your phone, and he said he's able to 
track you because your phone essentially is a permanent tracking device where you are in the store in front of what product. And he, he said, we're trying to figure out how to use that because they're an advertising company and they want to sell into that. But I, I don't know, you know, I, it's probably being done. Nielsen, I know, was doing a lot of work on that. And I think they're using it much more around the device because the camera can give you a sense as to what they're doing. But then the device is much more able to be activated. So they're aiming at things that are activated. Now, talk to someone in detail. They will know more than me. I know we've got clients pushing more on how do I create offers based on GPS, not necessarily how do I watch what people are doing. The reason I'm asking, we make cameras for like like that for, yeah. for use in retail. I wonder how spread it is and how um, how how many companies ask for it or are interested in that. The most interesting thing I saw a camera being applied to is it's is very random. Security cameras have an amazing ability to capture footage on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. And so they perfected the technique to watch video and then interpret it. Mm -hmm. The bigger application for that is how to find a way to take that capability, I guess, and apply it to real-time streaming TV online. Because if you're watching TV online, and all of a sudden, I was mentioning this very the way, and someone jumps in and they see like a boogeyman, advertisers don't want to be near that. So if you can take that technology of watching and repurpose it to be an intelligent engine watching video online, then there might be more of a use for it than watching people. Or there might be an equal use, I don't know. Other? I think, you know, we got a big program this morning, so I don't want to take any more time. I thank you so much. I'll be around for part of the morning. I have to go be in a call at noon, but this has been really helpful, and I hope for you guys as well. Thanks so much. So in addition to our speakers, I want to thank Meredith Lockyer, who is uh, the Associate Director for the Center of Public and Sharon Ballard, who is, who is manning the, uh, the registration table. Uh, so many would not have happened without them, so appreciate their help. So uh, I'd like to introduce Mark Lanfeld. He is an Exodet's Vice President of Analytics Innovation, which I think is a really awesome title. Uh, he's responsible for overseeing the strategy and innovation of analytics solutions ensuring a Nexonet's customers successfully transform into data-driven, customer-centric enterprise. So, welcome, Mark. Thank you. That sounds good. Yeah. Uh, appreciate everybody uh, attending. Let's lower this a little bit. Um, so, it was a great segue, I think, based on what Mark just showed you know, about the marketing side. I think what we're going to really focus more today for this chapter is going to be more on the operational side, so once they're a customer, all the operational efficiencies that are possible with better understanding the customer through these customer analytics. So, again, Mark Langsfeld, I'm the VP of Innovation for Anexinet. I, about 10 years ago, I started a company called Listen Logic, which did social media analytics. And so that was tracking sentiment for large companies, uh, risk, uh, insights for marketing, uh, basically a substitute for market research. And uh, about a year and a half ago, we were acquired by a large private equity firm called Marlin. And Marlin had just previously purchased an Exonet. The idea was, let's put these two companies together, then add on some more that really focus uh, around these next generation digital applications um, using AI, machine learning, automation um, to really drive companies' operational efficiency and more on the marketing side, too. Uh, so again, so today, this is a, next is really an IT consulting shop that's pivoting real time uh, to be more of a next gen digital application company, analytics company. Uh, basically full life cycle support for cloud analytics digital, about 250 employees currently. Uh, again, will be more of a roll up strategy here in the next year. And uh, voted seven years in a row for best places to work. So enough about the company. Um, Customer 360, who here has heard of like Customer 360? Uh, okay, yes. So, and also, raise of hands, this, this, this is my first time at one of these events. How many are like pub faculty or student body? Okay. And the rest are commercial? Right, it's like that, right? Great, awesome. So, Customer 360, it's been around for years. Uh, 
What's really changed, I would, I would say, in the last probably week two, is how we're using you now algorithms to mine the data using more enterprise data in general without going off and using third party information or actually supplementing that with actual enterprise data. So there's a number of use cases, uh, benefits and outcomes to leveraging you know, customer 360. Today we're really going to be focusing on two of those. Again, you could use operational 360 uh, insights to do increasing revenue and that's kind of like what Mark talked about. You can do what's called fake brand loyalty, certainly on the customer sat side, reducing attrition side. But more importantly, I think today we have a couple case studies and just a lot of like workload we've sort of worked out over the last year, some real use cases um, and some pretty interesting insights for lowering operating, operating cost, reducing risk within a large company. So, and there's two use cases. One is gonna be on financial services, mostly insurance, so property and casualty insurance, and the other is gonna be on life sciences. Uh, again, customer journeys changed dramatically in the last couple of years. Uh, companies can either, you know, my, it, it's funny that you have really two different organizations within most of these enterprises today. You've got those that sort of deal with the traditional uh, interactions, and then those of like the e-commerce center of excellence social center of excellence, uh, they're really in silos. We're starting to see now a consolidation across the board in enterprises that look between marketing, customer service, a bunch of different business units uh, that look at this holistically as this customer journey. I thought this was really interesting from a new report from McKinsey, which is typically measurements been done at the interaction level. So I'm tracking, tracking sentiment in social, I'm tracking sentiment in the call center, I'm tracking sentiment, um, maybe with my agents, I'm doing net promoter scores, right? I'm doing you know, surveys. But what really matters is that we're working at an end-to-end -end experience. So if I'm a customer, let's say, of a financial services, you know, maybe it's property and casualty, I wanna add my daughter just got a car, um, she needs now to be added to my policy, what do I need to do to add her to a policy? So let's say I talk to my agent. Agent says, well, happy to add you. Here's a rough estimate of quotes. Um, you know, get back to me. I then call the call center. Because, and let's say this net promoter score or satisfaction rate was 90% for that interaction. Then I go and call the call center. Um, talk to the call center. Hey, I want to add my, my daughter. 85%, let's say, satisfaction. So in and of itself, relatively happy. You know, they, at least the company thinks I'm relatively happy. And then they say, go, please go activate this account and go to the web and then you know, be sure there to sort of do an e-sig. So I go into the e-sig, I'm relatively happy, but maybe there's an issue with billing, so I have to call up customer support again, get 90% satisfaction. You really need to look at each of these interactions as a whole for that one issue or experience. And if you multiply those together, you'll see it's a 60% score, which is actually kind of crappy, right? So for me, the company is looking at each of these silos at, at an interaction level, doing net promoter scores, surveying customer sat. But at the end of the day, for the whole experience, it's actually kind of crappy. They're not looking at it holistically. So there's you know, really this current disconnect in the marketplace between what companies think they're doing for success versus what customers believe these companies are doing for their success. So 80% of businesses, businesses think that they're doing a great job, superior customer service, um, for dealing with their customers. Yet, customers of those companies who actually survey see that about 8% feel like they're doing a superior job. So there's definitely this disconnect between what companies think and what customers think. Also interesting stat that 62% report having to do a repeat contact for an issue, which is pretty crappy. So it's really important to redesign from the customer back, right? look at the customer, solve for their experience, and then look at all the different interactions, all the different processes, technologies we have in place to basically optimize for the customer. So let's talk about the customer. Customers today are multi-channel, typically have three or four de devices or certainly channels to access and interact with companies. They hate waiting on calls. In fact, this is something that I was just doing some research a couple of days ago for this. There's an actually an, a community now, an online community called On Hold With that tracks really long phone calls that people are on hold with. 
all on Twitter, Facebook. They're collecting close to about three million posts a day. I thought it was interesting. This this particular consumer was on hold with DirecTV for four hours. I mean, it's just, you know, it's crazy. Um, so, again, people are watching. This is a core metric. Uh, typically, companies try to resolve issues faster, right? It's a cost structure, these care centers. Yet there's one company called, you know, which is Zappos, that actually celebrates really long calls because it's all about the customer experience. In this case, it's almost an 11-hour phone call that happened about a year ago. I uh, thought that was really interesting. Yet most clients are looking to shorten those call times and improve, you know, while keeping that customer experience relatively um, high. So consumers or customers, they get mad, right? This is something that happened a couple years ago. I believe it was the first tweet. Again, this person will obviously through British Airways, lost their baggage, he promoted it, right? So he actually went and spent money, his own money, to go promote the fact that they suck at you know, baggage, basically. Um, they can get even. So my wife actually had one of these cars about 10 years ago. I agree with this uh, customer that uh, definitely want to be, you know, <laughs> you're in the shop quite a bit with that particular Range Rover. Um, using customer data, let's say on the web, through the call center, through email, through chat, all these different inbound signals is also a terrific feedback loop for an early warning signal. So product quality issues, things like that. Uh, Chobani, maybe, I don't know if you guys remember back about three or four years ago, had this issue with mold in their uh, yogurt. Uh, there was a recall that was announced, and it was like, oh my god. We uh, at Listen Logic were actually, uh, we, we got a call from the Wall Street Journal saying, hey, this, week, you know, this recall this was announced. Can you guys go back in social media, just like in the last, let's say, six months, and see if consumers are talking about this? We're just curious if this is something that just popped up or it's been an ongoing issue. So we actually saw that consumers were complaining about this particular mold issue six weeks before the recall happened, and obviously thereafter. And then it, I didn't, I sort of lost, we actually did a piece with the journal, they published it, uh, it's pretty awesome. And uh, before this presentation today, I went back just to see what sort of happened. I didn't realize the FDA, uh, the FDA did an inspection report and found out that they did see that there was previous problems before and after the recall too. So it sort of validated what we were seeing in the uh, um, marketplace. Again, product risk is something that, uh, you know, it's a big opportunity. <coughs> so companies that offer best in class customer experience. We sort of talked before, you know, about more of the marketing side. Let's talk about customer experience. Companies that offer best in class customer experience with them, right, what's in it for me, tend to grow faster and more profitably. New report from McKinsey, uh, who's really pushing this hard, Price Waterhouse, Ernst & Young, a bunch of these guys really, you know, I think they're all behind this chain. Of you can literally grow 2x, let's say, revenue growth, and, and certainly lower your operating costs by reducing call volume, increasing success rate of cross selling, right? Increasing customer loyalty, uh, there's direct outcomes here. So how do we get there, right? Um, and then it's no surprise that enhancing the customer experience is the number one priority for every large or medium-sized business now. This is a survey from Gartner. We've worked with the Gartner analysts for the last couple of uh, months. And they are saying literally like, you know, six out of 10 now, this is their focus, enhancing the customer experience. And followed by improvement of process efficiency. So clients, uh, companies, they all have different maturity levels or the sort of spectrum of analytics of where they are and where they wanna go. You see on the left side, you know, kind of that passive reporting capability where you're looking more at what happened, where you're doing more static reporting. Uh, this is not big data, right? Uh, then you have more advanced reporting where you're really deciphering why did it happen, right? Why did the customer sort of behave this way? More proactive reporting, much more big data, you probably have a data lake, there's certain systems you have to make this type of insight. Then you have the predictive layer, which is basically what will happen. And, and so before it was interesting, if you talked to me a year ago or anyone a year ago in this industry, you would see that after predictive, there was prescriptive. And what's interesting today is I'm, we're seeing less and less of prescriptive. It's now called automation. And it's because you can actually teach machines to do the machine action, whereas before you actually needed a human 
to look at the predictive layer and then maybe make recommendations to become prescriptive. But machines actually do a better job at that. So really it's automation uh, where you can take as a final journey, right? Where you actually can outsource to a machine workflow. And so we're seeing real use cases of that today um, with some of our accounts and clients. Taking all this data into one view, this is actually some of the folks at uh, Click, Clicks here today to stay dead, um, where we can basically ingest 10, 20 different sources of data, unstructured and structured, um, into these views that solve different business cases. They could be operational, they could be sales, um, it could be legal, it could be product risk. Um, so the primary reasons, again, reducing operating costs, increasing revenues, mitigating risks. So you can see your customers' interactions in one single view. So now, all of a sudden, if I go in and I'm the company, normally you have different silos. I tweeted, I called, I did a chat session, whatever. This thing actually shows, hey, in October, I called, I had a billing issue. Then I tweeted later, two months later, about an outage of, of an issue. Um, I, I then canceled, let's say, uh, with a tweet, billing in payment later, uh, all in one view that I can then click right down into the interaction. And so a question was asked before, um, how do we capture emotions of our customers, right? And, and so how do we track the sentiment of our customers via social media? This is an example of what we're doing in voice to text uh, with newer technologies that are out there today that weren't even around you know, three or four years ago. They're getting much better. Costs has come down tremendously. Um, where you can actually capture the emotion and sentiment of callers in their exchange with the agents, and this is live. So we're seeing here is a transcription that literally is just red is negative, green is positive words that are sort of bolded or sort of the cues, the signals of that uh, emotion. You can see we're tracking not just typical metrics like call duration, but we can see the silence time, so between speakers. And by the way, this is actually a mono signal, not a two-way channel. So the first person who speaks can typically be signed as the agent. The next person the algorithm hears, it switches and assumes it's the customer, and it goes back and forth and diarizes based on that exchange. So it's like a script. So you can see silence time, agent clarity. Again, these are all algorithms that understand language using neural nets. Um, it understands if it's a male or female, all through, again, tonality. And then the motion spectrum throughout the call. So is it positive, is it getting um, more positive, is it starting out negative and becoming more negative? Those are all ways that you can now start to really measure your customer experience. And again, this is live. So the platform that we have built over the last, I would say, three or four years, takes data on the left. So this, again, this is unstructured and structured. It can be calls from the call center using voice to text, social media, email, te text, chat, um, it can take PDF documents, so like even using OCR to extract out text from letters, um, CRM, transactions, all that data to basically unify it around a customer ID. And I can now see Mark, Mark, whatever, everything about who we are, what we purchased, and everything we've ever said about the company or the product within one literally point. So um, what's interesting is that you can apply things now like machine learning to this, to really understand the segmentation, to understand business process. Um, and we typically follow a more traditional view. I saw last year's uh, presentation, I think a couple of the guys at SAP talked about this. There's the insight from the analytics, there's the identify and prioritize, and there's, then there's the implement stage. Definitely one um, focal point before you even start out with this is identifying the use cases. So what are we trying to solve for? Let's say we're trying to solve for call center efficiency. So you know, we have 1,000 agents. It's cost us about $50 million as far as a unit to kind of support and keep that agent, you know, the uh, call center up and running. Customer stats really important to us. How do we improve it? Uh, maybe it's lowering average call times. So there's three options here. We can coach our agents and help, you know, help them do better best practices, maybe training, coaching, sitting down, and today it's all done by hand with managers. Managers sit down with an agent, listen to four or five phone calls a month, and say, here's what you're doing well, this is maybe some things you can work on, 
Uh, this is how you can maybe shorten your call for these types of calls, the, the four or five that you listen to manually. Um, and maybe there's some technology improvements along the way. But when you actually apply analytics um, to this, you can look at everything. So you can actually categorize all interactions, um, be it a phone call, chat, voice, whatever. Um, so you can understand why people are contacting the company holistically, again, all through algorithms. So we can then tag this data to CRM we can then tag it to really understand why are people calling, uh, why, what do they do after they call, who they tend to then tweet, um, and you can basically automate satisfaction. So here's an example of one use case, which is, okay, CSRs, customer service reps, they uh, require coaching, right? And today that's all done by hand, where a you know, manager will sit down and say, okay, Janice, this is what we could work on. But here with analytics, you can see that this particular agent has, an, let's say an average call time here is about six minutes uh, in general. Jessica, Jessica is about 2x that. She's about 10 minutes of phone call for 300 calls in this particular three week window. So it's not immaterial. She's spending almost twice as long as she should be. But what's really interesting is that if you look at her sentiment of average sentiment of a call, it's pretty much in the toilet. So what is going on with Jessica and her phone calls? These are 300 phone calls that pretty much everything goes south fast, right? Red alert. Again, that's all something that you can detect pretty much with one click. Um, in these views. So when you look at this holistically, you can see that we can now benchmark all agents against each other and look for maybe opportunities to save money, right? Or certainly either coach them or potentially get rid of them. In this case, this is with one of our uh, a POC we did for one of the largest uh, insurance companies you, you see on the news and on the uh, TV and radio. We looked at just a sub, sub segment of their uh, population of policies, where we only had, I think it was about a million um, records, it was a million policies in their data, and saw that by just looking at the top 10 sort of worst performers of agents, these are all agents or CSRs, we could save them about $300,000 a year, $400,000 a year. It really does translate to about $4 or $5 million for the company, holistically. Again, it was a small sample that we looked at, but it was representative of what um, all the agents you know, were performing. Any questions for this one before we sort of jump into other workflows? Yes. Do you have any um, We do, yes. So um, I guess we'll get into that shortly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so then you also have this, well, maybe it's not an agent coaching opportunity, but when we look at the data, we see why people are basically contacting the company through algorithms, and it can be multiple things. It doesn't just have to be what agents are tagging those calls to be about. It's called a reason code. Oh, a person called about this, a person called about that. This thing's looking at all of the data, and basically tagging it with reasons or topics. So when you look at all these different co-present type of reasons, you can understand sort of what's driving phone calls and where those times are being allocated. In this case, we saw that there were three different types of calls, billing and payment, discount calls, and price calls, that were taking about two to three times, again, average call times. Why? So we were in this, uh, was in uh, Cleveland, David and I were there uh, about two months ago, and we're sitting down with the president of the firm and uh, about 20 other people, including the head of the contact center. So we showed this slide, and it was a little bit different, this was real data, and, uh, and he looks at the, uh, the, the, hair, the head of the care center and says, well, you know, what's going on with these phone calls? And the guy turns red, he's sort of defensive, and uh, but he's like, you know, don't worry about it's not like it's your fault. It's just like, this is really awesome stuff. And why is it taking so long for billing and payment calls? And these guys say it could save us about a million dollars a year. It's probably about $10 million a year at the enterprise level. Like, what's going on? And he goes, well, it's because they have to access three different systems to resolve this phone call. And uh, they have to go into three different screens. They have to log in two different times. And he's like, okay, well, um, how do we fix that? And he says, well, if we could build an app, that actually tied in these three different like use cases with one login, we could probably get this down to about half. And he goes, okay, well, how much would that cost? And he said, well, we've been, we've been talking about this for the last couple of years, and it's like a significant investment. It's about half a million dollars to go build this thing. Um, so we're like, okay, and so he's looking at the screen, he's looking at you know, us, and he's like, but 
these guys are saying I could probably sell you $10 million a year um, if we fix it. So literally a 10x you know, annual savings or ROI if we just go and do this. And so that's something that these, this firm is doing, um, all based on the stake in the sand of identifying the insight and then basically quantifying the cost or savings value so they know how to reinvest their money. Again, real world example where they can now make decisions off of that insight. Another example here is what we call the other problem. So in this client, no joke, half their phone calls were tagged as other. So they had no idea why people are contacting the company, and that's why they actually wanted to try something here. Um, they were like, we will, what's your objective of this uh, you know, POC? Well, POC is we, we want to understand why people are contacting the call, the call center. Interesting, you don't know why? No, because half the calls are tagged as other. And that's because of a host of reasons. Usually it's because either the agent's lazy, it could be that multiple things were discussed on a phone call, so it's just, it's, it happens everywhere. Um, maybe it's not 50%, but you know probably 25% is a minimum you'll see in a, at any company. So what we did is we actually used this algorithm, right, the, doing the voice to text, the text money of calls, text money of social media and other data, to see what these things were about. And it was interesting that in this case, it was about all of the other call types or reason codes, just co-present, meaning they talked about billing, and then there was a website issue, right? They talked about website, they talked about policy change, a rate increase, something else. And so there was no way to kind of select two things, so agents just selected other. Again, now you can boil that down, get the insights, because this is getting it to a pure signal of what's going on with inbound calls. So what's interesting here is that the company is now saying, you know what, why are we spending an extra minute or two with our agents to go select the right reason for the call? Let's just automate that process, right? There's no reason why we need to like have the human CSR make an interpretation about what's going on. Let's just actually have the analytics drive that for us. It knows more, right? It's unbiased. So in general, I would say, companies across the board that have a million or more phone calls, let's say about a million a year, typically by just doing this, will save about a million dollars of operating costs right out of the gate, increase their monitoring compliance um, capability while also automating that, I'll go into that shortly uh, with, the use, with a you know, case study, improve their the CSAT scores pretty, pretty dramatically, and then improve first call resolutions uh, meaningfully. I mean, all these net net are about three to four million dollars of benefit for again a, a company that's doing a million phone calls a year. That's not a lot of phone calls. So it just shows you how much inefficiency is in uh, a legacy or, or not a next gen enterprise that can be optimized. So another example I'll leave, um, which is really interesting and it has to do with public safety. So we talked about tweets. We talk about calls. Um, there's some new mandates that are actually happening. It started late last year with the European Medicines Agency and the FDA. And this is basically, okay, companies, for years I know, are, is anyone here familiar with adverse events or side effects you know, with medicines, right? So it's a requirement that you know, manufacturers of drugs or medicines have to basically monitor or track and report adverse events to the FDA or any kind of regulatory agency. Um, is compliant, it's law, you just have to do this. And so if you're like a research company and you're doing like a panel research and people are saying, you know, I took this medicine, it feels great, sometimes I'm a little tired, like that's an adverse event, you gotta like flag that and then send it to the company. The company then takes it, there's a whole group of drug safety who basically looks at this and says, okay, is this a real adverse event? What was the side effect? Is it, is it a known side effect? This is new? And then they have to process that and ultimately submit it to the FDA. So some of these large life science companies literally have millions and millions of patients. And so they will get tens of millions of calls and reports a year from uh, all these different bodies. And it could be third parties, it could be their own, let's say, inbound call centers. Um, what's interesting is that today, uh, they're doing all this by hand. So literally, you know, reports come in, it could be a file, email, PDF, they have to go take that PDF type it in, in, in a database and basically submit it into their Argus systems um, to then be processed. Uh, they have to listen to the phone calls and they're talking to patients, right? And they have to like spend an extra hour, half hour processing all this stuff, again, from the FDA and EMA. 
uh, when someone says that I'm tired or I'm, you know nauseous or whatever. Um, so again, they have to do this, and it's a huge cost structure. They will literally have anywhere between 100 people and 500 people doing this in source outsource. Um, you know, just just to process this this uh, type of activity. So we actually about a year ago came up with a method using again the new developments of machine learning to take this data, flag it for an adverse event. There's libraries out there that have like millions of different vernacular, um, and then the gap came to well, if someone says they're tired of taking Viagra or tired of taking Advil, versus I'm so tired of seeing the Advil commercial. It's very different context. One's an adverse event, one is not. And so the context is really important when you have the process. So what's happened up until now is it has to go to a person who then has to inspect it. It could be here, it could be in India, just to say, is this a real adverse event or not? Well, with machine learning now, you can actually train that. And so we're using things like called recurrent neural nets, which are really good at understanding time series of sentence structure. So it's actually kind of a next-gen NLP um, approach um, it's not NLP, it's actually looking at time series of sentence structure to see that noun, adjective, noun, verb, noun being obviously the brand, verb being the adverse event. Uh, you know, is it truly an adverse event about the brand or is it about something else? And so with this, seeing accuracy rates literally on par or better than what humans are typically processing <coughs> and literally a 10x savings on time uh, and money uh, with automating this whole, whole entire process. So, Again, something that uh, one of our clients wants to track all of social media for their brands, just understand, is anyone experiencing a side effect that's unbeknownst to them? So these are things that are potentially not you know, known, um, that I get tired, that I get headaches, or something else, maybe it's like you know, liver issues. Um, so again, public safety use cases that um, are just great to see and, and saving really you know, tens of millions of dollars as far as infrastructure costs. So I'll leave this at this, and this is sort of parting thoughts, final thoughts. Use the data that you have as an enterprise. Uh, people are already contacting you. Uh, using it for you know, driving efficiency, using it for managing risk, using it for you know, cross-selling, upselling. But just don't do this, right, where you're basically you know, doing surveys at the end. Um, and I've probably had this happen like, you know, three or four times a year, right, where a sales guy is like, hey, be sure to give me a good um, review for my rescue. So. Um, that's what I have. You know, appreciate any questions. <coughs> yes. So, so I'm curious with the with the um, protecting of adverse events. How is the FDA? Uh, you know, because that's a big part of the regulatory process. Yeah. Is the FDA treated the same as traditional, or are they skeptical or excited? Yeah. Two years ago, they were skeptical. I think now they're ambitious. It's probably you know, okay. this if they want to solve it. Um, the EMA came out with a policy mandate back in November that said basically companies are now responsible for 100% of their data. It's a data integrity mandate, which is like Sarbanes Oxley, right? But for data monitoring, and so automation was recommended. And so when that happened, it was when a number of our pharma clients reached out to us and biotech clients and said, hey, we want to start building processes here, knowing the FDA was watching. So it's really Europe that's driving the innovation. And then I think the question now the FDA is watching very closely. So the issue with um, machine learning, deep learning, um, is it's black box. And so they want to see that you follow this process, the FDA does. And they can kind of QC it all along the way. We can do that up to a certain point, and then it does become black box. And that's really where it comes down to outcomes and success rates and recall and precision rates. And they just run the data sets against it. Yes, yes, absolutely. Good question. Yeah. You mentioned social listening, but I think like the same question, combining the unknown side effects with you using some type of drug. How do you get the data about, um, about them using the drug? As far as they being the primary user of the drug I mean, versus just measuring it? Yeah, I mean, you, yeah, you, you read in the social media, okay, I'm yeah. tired or I don't feel well, whatever. Yeah. How do you combine that data? with that this person is using Viagra or whatever. Nobody yeah. posts about that. No, well they do post about that they are taking some medication and this was a side effect of that medication. So they have to combine the two 
online. They have to. You can't. Otherwise, yeah. Okay. So yes. you don't read them online. No. Exactly. Uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so we've, we're looking for explicit signals at this point. Um, now, it's different when you actually have, like, say, a call, because the call doesn't necessarily have to have a brand in it, because they're calling an 800 number hotline, yeah. so it's inferred why they're calling. Yeah. Um, so it's really they are just looking for the address of that term. Yeah. So this technology sounds very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, does it mean you can only serve it to big companies? No. So it, I would say it was expensive uh, probably three or four years ago. It's probably 10% of the price that it was three or three years ago. It just voice to text, machine learning, the cloud, um, you know, those costs have like literally just become pennies on the dollar for the last couple of years. So it's making us much more effective. 100 to 1. 100 to 1, yeah. Yeah. Relative compression and cost. Yeah. Yeah, so it's becoming much more cost effective, certainly than running it with people. Okay. Yeah. And you also, I saw a CRM there on the slide. So Yeah, so the CRM systems, there's like, again, depends on what type of systems. It's about getting data out at a minimum. So you can do data extraction, let's say once a day, once an hour, you can just do a raw extraction of the field. So let's say certain customer IDs that are important. Um, you can also integrate, again, through APIs, it depends on what type of systems exist, to append data that we see to CRM. So when, let's say, you pull up, there's all the data that we actually found throughout social calls in CRM as a container. So you do that. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Yeah. You talked about use cases, one being customer service. Have you ever used it before the like to market either telemarketing calls or internal sales rep calls that are fielding constant calls from not yet customers but prospects? Yeah. To determine what what works the best yeah. to get that sale. Uh, so there's a there's a program we're doing right now with a, it's a lead gen uh, financial services outbound call effort, and it's exactly the same process. So basically, we take the call recordings, transcribe them into text. We take CRM. Um, we can then solve for outcomes, so we can actually get the transaction data. Did something actually become a sale? Yeah. And then look at those. There was it's called a same key kind of chart, kind of like Mark showed where you can show outcomes on the right, so was this a sale, was this not a sale? And then you can show everything before that, like this is what they called about, this is when they called, this is the agents that called, this is about the products they called, and you can just do a bunch of simulations to solve for best practices about what was successful in beginning to sales and what wasn't. And it's just a classic A-B testing optimization you know, scenario. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you're transcribing calls in real time, are you able then to empower the call center persons to Next react and like, yeah. so the other day I had a situation, I'm like, if only they offer me a 20% discount, I'll buy right now, right? Yeah. I don't think they were empowered to do that. Yeah. So, you know, people building that. They're starting to build it now. Yeah, it's called next best, next, next best action. And uh, it just requires further integration with the SIP uh, program. So. You know, because this technology now is so fast, where it wasn't a couple of years ago, it wasn't possible. But you have to direct connect to the recording, or the you know the audio the signal. Uh, literally, you can transcribe it in real time. We we build out based on historical, let's say, um, a corpus, uh, and then we can apply rules to that. So you know, next best action, and you sit down with people and managers, typically experts at the, uh, the company, saying, okay, if this is said what should be the response. If this is said, what should be the response? And you go through a bunch of those rules, and that becomes your rule engine, rules engine you apply onto this application. So then it just serves it up to the agency in real time. Something else that I think a dovetail, which is interesting, um, we talked about the CSRs and like finding with Jessica, and Jessica was like much slower, and, and her calls were less optimal, right? Normally, you have all that um, coaching done by hand. And so something we're actually now starting to pilot and, and, and learn, you know, get into, it's actually automating the whole coaching thing. And because you have all the data, right? We know, okay, we have everything about every call that say an agent has now done since they've been here. Uh, we know where they struggle, where they don't. Let's actually do the same thing with, okay, next best action, and actually have like email, chat, whatever, CRM integration that sends to Jessica coaching recommendations, videos, all based on her performance at stake. And so literally it could be like a step function where every couple of weeks, I try this, learn this, go to Manual X, and uh, using that to basically, you know, optimize, you know, training. 
and uh, it's a lot more efficient than having to sit down just once a month, let's say, with your manager and go, going over four phone calls. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, it really depends on the, on the company. Um, so that was, a that was a dialogue. I remember sitting in a room with the chief um, compliance officer in the lines of business having this debate. This is like one of the biggest banks there is. And um, they said, is, the question is discoverable, right? That's right. And um, so most organizations keep calls for some duration of time for compliance reasons. It could be seven years, 10 years, depending on industry. Um, the idea here is that they'd actually want to do this voice and text because it's a lot more efficient to keep than audio files, and you can keep it forever, right? Um, so to answer your questions, I think the interpretation that the chief uh, compliance officer said was, no, this is actually a, um, it's a, a new risk, but it's something the next year I think that the um, SEC and regulators are going to start saying, you're, it's the data integrity issue we're seeing in the Europe. I think they're sort of all going to this point where you're responsible for your data. Um, and it's interesting that in this meeting, again, with the compliance officer, he said, he was sort of laughing, because we used to actually go give them like a million recordings of audio files, put them on a hard drive, and like just say, here it is, here's everything. You know, it's sort of like, you know, you go in with the old legal files and just pull up on the map, you know, 18 wheeler and say, here's all the due diligence, go have it. And uh, they didn't have the tools to rip through that. Now they do. So they're sort of the mindset, let's just make this all transparent and they're gonna you know the FDA is gonna or the you know SEC is gonna be able to find this now anyway. So there's no reason to you know, it's all discoverable now. My second question is about consumer privacy. Do you have to amend your recordings mm -hmm. uh, the message up front recording about what It's a really good question. It's so funny that I would say in, in most every project we work with doing this integration, I can't think of one where they had all their data ready. Meaning those calls were in some repository, some archive, without any customer ID or PIN. So literally they were being recorded for quality assurance purposes. I mean, they were just in its own little silo. So the first thing you have to do is you have to go in there and figure out how to connect those calls to the CRM and, 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 and agents because there, there's no logging. And so you have to do it with fuzzy matching at first, right, where you look at timestamps and maybe they have agents and you, know, you can sort of get there. Um, but ultimately it requires the company to integrate all these different data sets with a customer ID or some kind of pin. Um, so anyway, that, that's like one of the biggest hurdles, you know, that, that we're definitely um, seeing in the marketplace. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. All right, no, appreciate everybody listening and uh, feel free to come up with any questions and uh, look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you. Once again, thanks everybody. Uh, our next speaker, is Scott Stopper. And Scott is a Chief Technology Officer and Ad Tech Executive, uh, most recently at Mindshare. Uh, he's a uh, digital marketing strategy expertise in ad tech solutions, implementing complex digital advertising campaigns with the use of big data and analytics. He is also a double graduate of the Villanova School of Business, so we have to give him uh, a round of applause for that. Thank you very much. Uh, and it, it's interesting, it's great to be back in this area and back at Villanova. It's it's a little bittersweet though with the the passing of Raleigh Massimino recently and it's, that was tough to see. And it was actually my very first time on this campus was 1985 summer and I was in the Raleigh Massimino basketball camp. And I was convinced back then that I was gonna get offered a scholarship during that camp. <laughs> I was wiry back then, trust me. And we went through the, the layup drills, and there, there's Coach Massimino, and that's what we're all hoping for, you know, to, to get that recognition. And he's going through the line and commenting on our different skill sets. And he comes up to me, and I'm like, this is it. He's gonna offer me the scholarship. I, I'm feeling it. 14 years old, and I already have my scholarship to Villanova. Pulls me aside and says, so do you have interests other than basketball? <laughs> and I didn't get it at the time. I'm like, yes, computers. He's like, that's good, and walks away. And I'm like, so 
that was the end of my MBA dream, uh, which is probably a good thing. Um, but yeah, so I went into technology, been in technology for 25 years now, uh, focusing 15 years in big data analytics, the last 10 years focusing in digital advertising. What I want to go over today is just giving a background of analytics and, and how it plays a role in digital advertising and all the different touch points that goes behind those ads you see on the internet, um, the digital campaigns, uh, and then understanding how it's growing. And for the most part, we're probably still in the infancy of that. So I just thought it would be good to see some of the pros, the cons, and how things have developed over the years. So yeah, there's an absolute explosion in data and analytics. And it was funny, some of the things that have come up, like uh, Mark mentioning the, the genome project earlier, that took 13 years to map the human genome and cost about a billion dollars. <laughs> now, to do that exact same work with where technology is, costs about three to $5,000 and takes two days. So Mark's point earlier about how the costs have come down to do some of these things, I, it really is. I mean, the things we can do now, for me being on the technology side first and then the analytics was huge to see that the technology finally caught up with the amount of data we have so we can actually process it, so we can actually work with it. Um, then we have cloud-based vendors where you can get ad tech companies up and running, not necessarily overnight, but a lot faster than you used to. The analytics playing a part, um, let's go back to the first Mark's presentation, talking about grocery stores and those touch points and analyzing the data. Things come out of that, for example, Home Depot. They layer in weather reports, and you can see that before a storm, store at Home Depot's in Florida, Houston, ran out of plywood to board up windows. Think about it, it's kind of obvious. Right? I mean, you need to take care of it. Home Depot is going to run out of things. They ship their inventory. What's not as obvious is when you look at Walmart, and every hour they're going over more than a billion transactions, loading that into a database and layering in data. What Walmart found is before a storm, stores were selling out of Pop Tarts. Not as obvious. I wouldn't have guessed that one. But that's the type of real insights. They see that information coming in, can make a change, can adjust their inventory channels, making sure they get that type of information. Facebook, Facebook, Twitter, um, companies need to be on it, right? Why? We're still not sure. Um, people see the number of likes their companies are getting, like, we need to get that. 34,000 likes every minute, our company needs to get likes. Why? Still don't know. But companies feel left out if they're not on there, if they're not participating in that. They're, they're realizing now you need more than just to be there and have a strategy for being there and where you want them to, where you want your customers to see you, how what you're posting, how you want them to interact. Tweets. <laughs> 175 million in 2012 seemed like a lot in a day. 500 million in 2016 and 2017 is just an insane amount. If you think about it though, that's the same number in both years. So I think it's starting to slow down. Um, I've heard more people are getting off Facebook, off Twitter, so maybe we're ready for the next thing to, to hit. Um, but again, the numbers are just huge. Um, and yeah, 35 billion pieces of content shared. And that's where the analytics is coming in. Social media, pulling that information in, understanding what's going on in that. What are you posting on there? How can you monetize it? So this is something near and dear to my heart. There's tons of data out there. There's also tons of bad data out there. And you need to understand when you're working with these different vendors, are they giving you the accurate data? How can you validate that? How can you do your own due diligence to follow up on that to make sure you, there are so many, and I'll get to it a little bit, so many different touch points and you're using this information to optimize campaigns, showing a different ad, showing a different price, um, targeting somebody's shopping cart that they may have left items in there. Did they really? Is that accurate data? Is it relevant? Is it 
And it's also the timeliness of that. Uh, years ago, I was working with OMD, and they had the client H&R Block. H&R Block does most of their advertising between December, the end of December, to April 15th. Again, kind of obvious. By mid-February, they know if they're going to have a good year or not. They know based on the number of appointments already been scheduled, that based on the amount of applications that have been downloaded, the different tools they had, the number that have been downloaded, how good their entire fiscal year is. So you can imagine when they launch a campaign that they're looking at that information to come back fast. They want to know exactly what's being done. OMD, is anyone still familiar with Tiger Direct? Okay, um, dating myself a little. Uh, Tiger Direct is an online company that sells drives so people can build their own computers. OMD was overnighting drives from Tiger Direct to store the data on because they couldn't keep up with it. They were Every day they were overnighting more drives, installing it into their systems, loading the data on. They would take Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday morning, they would have the previous week's data ready to go. That would give them approximately three to four hours to do their analytics, come up with insights, and do their optimizations. Because they had a launch on Friday, so you want your fresh set of ads out for the weekend. What we did with Analyze the Technology Agency <laughs> working with them as part of the Omnicom family, consolidated all that processing, had the drives, used modern technology, and we did all the processing for them by by Monday morning at 10 o'clock. So that gave them four days to do their analytics and their insights. So bad data isn't necessarily just it's wrong. Sometimes it's right, but if it's not there to you in time, it doesn't do you any good. Again, back to the, the explosion technology, Akamai is a company that focuses on retargeting. 75 million events a day that they're looking at, online events, just to try to identify clients, potential customers to retarget them. It's a huge amount of data. 29% of their marketing departments have too little or no customer data. DMP um, is a data management platform. DMP stores information about customers, clients, that you can retarget online. It shows interest. Um, for example, if I'm on Ford's website, I may be interested in a car or a truck. If I'm looking at building, you know, and I'm going in and actually configuring a car, my interest level just went up a little. If I'm checking dealer inventory, again, now my interest is more likely to buy because I'm actually looking at local inventory. Customers can feed that information in. A lot of it starts with CRM data. One of the biggest CPG companies in the world came to us and said, hey, we need to build a DMP. Great, I had built DMPs before, so it was a great conversation to have. So why do you want to build a DMP? One, there's other companies out there that have built them, so you can just white label them and test them to you, but why do you want to build yours? hire a technology team, hire experts that have done that before, and go down that path. Well, Pepsi built their own DMP. So we felt we should build ours. Okay, not exactly the strategy I was expecting to hear. I was like, where is your CRM data? You have many, many of the biggest brands out there. Where is your CRM data? They didn't have a unified system tracking the CRM data across all their different brands to help them target to load that data into a DMP. It's the whole crawl, walk, run. They were sprinting before they learned how to crawl. You have to get the basics, you have to get that foundation done first. I, I feel it's almost required in most advertising decks to put this quote in from John Watermaker. Half the money I spent on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. I think he would love the current state of things. 
the amount of data that we're getting back, the understanding we have about the customers that we've never had before. It really, and again, this is mostly on the digital side. Traditional, it's tough. You still have print ads. You still have the magazines. You have companies like Cantar that are still trying to pull that information in and Nielsen pulling that information in, merging it into the total spent. It is a fraction. It is less than 10% of the total data being driven. It's all digital advertising. The spends are shifting, the data is shifting. US TV digital spend, looking at 2015 to 2020, expected growth 15.9% this year, $83 billion. Why that's significant, if you look down at the orange bars, it's finally passing television. And that's, again, that's a huge number. Especially you have the digital agencies that I've been a part of on Omnicom, Group M. They are focused on television. They made their money from television. They don't understand necessarily the digital era. It's still in its infancy. It's still growing. New products are coming up. Looking at manufacturing, which is very, very traditional marketing. They, they still focus a lot on trade shows. Again, for the first time, we're seeing their digital spend increase past traditional advertising. Um, in 2017 projected, 13.3% versus 19.9%. It's never crossed that before. It, it's information like that that we're realizing how big this boom really is. I think we already covered most of that. So 2011, for those that haven't seen this, another required advertising slide is the Lumiscape. Lumiscape shows the interaction touch points moving from the advertisers to the customers. And these are all the different touch points in it. You have the holding companies, you have the ad serving companies. And it was fun in the, in the early years of this saying, oh, I worked at that company, I worked at that company. This is 2011, there was approximately 100 different companies working in that. This is 2014. I had to drop the ends on it so it would actually fit more. Um, 350. Three years to jump by that much. 2017, and yeah, the font is smaller. It's not just your eyes. Um, 2017, we're nearly 2,000 vendors in the ad tech space. And it's being driven by two of the previous slides. One, as I mentioned, it's still in its infancy. You're coming out with these different ad tech vendors. Different areas are coming to light. Two is the $86.5 billion spend. All of these companies want their share of it. And because the market is still in its infancy, new ideas are coming up, new ways to target, new ways to aggregate data, is given an opportunity for all these companies to get their share. Where these different areas are coming to, ad serving was the, one of the original sides. Mark mentioned flash talking earlier. Um, flash talking was a friend of mine uh, because I worked at the competitor Point Goal. And I finally sat down with their CTO and he was one of the founders of the company. And he figured like this is our biggest competitor and like it will be animosity. Um, British, we sat down in a pub, had a, bo uh, had a beer, had a pint. Um, we were best friends. And it's like, how did you guys do that? I was like, well that was easy, but how did you guys do that? And it, it was it was so mind opening for me to see individuals that I respect and look up to are still trying to figure this stuff out as they go. And really trying to drive the success in what we do. As Mark mentioned earlier, milliseconds we build these ads that you see based on looking at your laptops, looking at your cookies, understanding what you've done before, understanding what you've seen before, what your interests are. The ad servers show the ads. The DMPs give the information to the ad server so they're showing the right ads, so it's the right context. It's given rise to programmatic platforms. Programmatic platforms pulls all this together. You know, it, the earlier example, your you know, Ford website, check local inventory, you're now tagged as somebody who's more likely to buy a car. Ford knows you're more likely to buy one of theirs if you went to check their local inventory, maybe schedule an appointment, maybe schedule a test drive. If you're Ford and I see you online, 
I'm going to pay more for that ad because I know you're more interested versus a random ad to somebody who's not interested, just branding. Viewability. So again, is the is the is the um, anyone familiar with the term below the fold? Okay. So there's a new and an old meaning of that. The old meaning, you had your newspapers folded in half, right? You paid more for ads that were above the fold than ads that were below the fold. Because odds are they wouldn't be viewed or wouldn't be viewed as often. Technology, internet, exact same thing. When you have to scroll down to see an ad, it's all below the fold. That makes sense. Here's the, here's the fun part. For years, we were charging as much for above the fold as below the fold. Advertisers were paying tons of money on ads that were never seen, because nobody scrolled down. From an ad serving side, we got the call to serve the ad, we sent it, we're gonna charge the publisher for it. The publisher's like, well, we sold the ad, we're gonna charge the advertiser for it. And it wasn't until a few years ago, Group M stood up and said, our advertisers are no longer gonna pay for ads that aren't seen. Again, it seems somewhat logical when you think about it. Oh, well, we're not gonna pay for ads you haven't seen? What that did is we have a series of viewability companies now. They're making money by analyzing data that's coming back to know if these ads were seen or not. A whole industry is now around viewability of ads. Ad blocking, I don't know how many here have had ad blockers. I have not installed an ad blocker because I'm in advertising, I figure that's, I'm gonna miss something, it's just wrong to do. There's also an agreement with the internet, an unspoken agreement. Why do you see ads on the internet? That's what makes the internet free, right? How many times do you go to these sites and it says free, or you sign up for something that's free? That means to you, I'm going to see ads when I go to this site. Um, is it Credit Karma, the free credit report? It's, it's free, but it's filled with ads and filled with recommendations of the credit cards you should have. To help your credit record know to pay for that site. That's the type of thing, now you have ad blocking, so what comes next? Now there's companies that are selling, building products, selling products back to publishers to circumvent ad blocking. So again, you can see it's in its infancy. The publishers are excited about that, is now they can recoup some of the costs that they're losing to ad blocking. There's also new ad blocking that puts in, well, yes, we're ad blocking, but what are you interested in seeing? Oh, you're interested in a Ford ad? I'm sorry I keep going back to Ford. I did build uh, campaigns for years, but it's just that I do own a Ford, but it's completely coincidental. Just, I was actually going through this. I was online trying to find an ad. Most frustrating thing ever, when you want to find an ad online and you can't find one. They're everywhere, and the Ford happened to be the first one I saw, so it's stuck in my head. Um, if you're interested in a Ford, you put in the ad blocker that you're interested in Fords, and they will sell that information to a DMP to help market you to find you better. So again, tomorrow there'll be a new post, a new online for another tech again as this evolves. Defining success, and that's kind of the crux of the presentation where we're going to with this. How do the analytics drive success? Well, first and foremost, you need to identify in that Lumiscape, where are you in that? What is your role? What are you trying to achieve? DMP, programmatic side, did you take the information in? Did you target the customer? Did you retarget them? Did you show the proper ad? Ad server company, did you show the ad? Publisher, did you sell the ad? Creative agency, it used to be the creatives just had to be an interesting ad. Another Ford example. Uh, years ago at Point Roll, we had a creative where you could customize your own Ford Mustang. And it was custom paint, custom rims. You could even customize the smoke coming out of the back tires. And it, it won awards just because people were interacting with it so long. Now, did that necessarily translate to somebody who was going to buy a Mustang? No. 
with the creative agencies have such a more difficult time now that they had to build out these interactive creatives to try to work. So from their perspective, did we build an ad to pull in the right information, to show the right thing at the right time that worked? Did we get the data back from it? The digital agency and the consultancies. The consultants, well, digital agencies first. Digital agencies, they're buying and selling the media. But at the same time, you go back to that Lumiscape side, they're interacting with and often picking all the different partners that they're working with. Tons and tons of analytical points that they're all bringing into one data set, creating a report for that information, optimizing it, and getting it back to the advertiser. Over the past couple of years, there's been a rise in the consultancies getting involved in this world that didn't previously exist. You now have Deloitte Digital, Accenture Digital. Um, McKinsey has a digital group now. Um, Razorfish, one of the agencies, now merged with Sapient, one of the consultancies. So you have Sapient Razorfish now. Why? Two reasons. One, the complexity. Two, well, the amount of money that's in this area again. The consultancies will always follow the money. And the advertiser. The advertiser is looking at two things. One, did the digital agency and the consultancy tell me what was going on with my campaign? Did they do it in a timely manner? Did they actually understand what's happening? Because once you pull all that information together, it may not be the campaign was a huge success. It could be the campaign was a huge failure. But the key point is that you understand the analytics enough that you understand why and what to optimize on. People that have been doing advertising for years, what was one of the most um, eye-opening things for me is how short the contracts are. On the ad server side, showing the ads, we could get hired for a campaign, and in two months you lose the client. And we had McDonald's, and we all celebrated McDonald's. We bought it, um, breakfast sandwiches for the entire company. I think it was three months later we lost McDonald's. <laughs> the good news is you have that, that short turnaround. Hopefully you'll get them back. Hopefully you impress them enough, even if something didn't work, that you have a second time to bring them back. But again, the other aspects of the advertiser did you actually sell more? Can you see from these ads that you're actually selling more? So again, from defining the success, how the analytics go in, you need to understand who you are in that, what you need to be successful, and what you need to convince the person probably above you, or next in the chain, and previous in the chain, that you did your job, did it successful, and passed the information along. Getting into the, the types of analytics, um, attribution analysis and path to conversion, there, there was a concept of, or still is a concept of last touch point. I clicked on the ad and then I went to Ford's website. It's a success. Where was that ad shown? Well, that shown was on Yahoo Auto. So that's what's driving. We see most of our things on Yahoo Auto, they're clicking on that. So we're only gonna show ads on Yahoo Auto. May not be the best way to go. Then it was, well, what's the full pants conversion? How many different sites was I on? And then I went there. So should I be, is there a magic formula to figure out of the pattern to identify people? You put in machine learning, you find out it's a lot of information. You almost find out the path not to conversion. It's not as much finding the magic path to get there, but finding the path people are taking that aren't helping you, that aren't leading to clicks, aren't leading to conversions. Cookie list device recognition. Um, for years, they've talked about cookies going away. Um, there are some recent events that looks like that's gonna happen. Uh, I'll get into that in a second. Cross device retargeting. Again, the question was asked, how many people here have multiple devices? Uh, I'm embarrassed to admit, um, had the, the work phone, the private phone, then I had the iPad mini, then I had the iPad, and then the Kindle, so I like reading all on the Kindle the best of, and then if I'm using one, I'm saving the battery life for the other. So I have all the devices with me. Yeah, I think I had them all with me today. Um, now, on bigger trips, I was like, all right, maybe I will consolidate that to, to one or two, but typically have the two phones. Typically have all these different devices. 
you use the analytics where these devices are. What IP addresses am I hitting? Pulling that information back to try to target the, you saw an ad on one thing, you interacted with the ad on another. Years ago, we didn't have the compute power, the processing to do that, now we can. Um, and data-driven creatives, pulling those information points back to, to the creatives. Here's an example of a past conversion with a auto manufacturer, it's actually not Ford. Um, and the plan was to mark all the, they were launching a new car, and they had a video out. And they wanted to see who saw the video, what did they do after they saw the video, did they see an ad before going to the video? Can we pull in third party data to understand the demographics about the individual that saw the ad? All the different areas, and then what did they do on the dealership website and pull this information together? This was a huge undertaking. It was a massive launch for the product. This ran for two weeks. They could only run it for two weeks. One, because the cost of having a unified cookie on all these different sites pulling this massive amount of data back, merging in the demographics. It, it just wasn't realistic, but the two weeks after the video launch, they gave them a very strong understanding of what happened. So then it was, all right, now we need to do the analysis. Now we need to find the path to conversion. What was the magic person, like what was the magic path? We needed to find somebody that went through all these things, that saw the video, and ultimately went and configured one of the cars and checked local inventory. The first one that was found was somebody who actually worked for the manufacturer and was aware of all this going on, so wasn't the best, but eventually we did find others that went through that and hit all the touch points. We could tell what their salary was, what their household income was. We could see that they were interested in it. We can now retarget that person. It's a huge amount of invasive information that we know that much about a household and their their uh, internet history and everything they're doing online to make these things up, but there's also holes in it. Household income, $200,000 a year. They're on the site configuring a high-end car, fantastic. They don't know is if it's the 14-year-old kid that's seen the video that thinks it's really cool that wants to configure the car, that's checking local inventory just because it's one of the tabs to hit. So there's definitely holes in trying to figure this, but it really comes down to truly understanding all the different touch points in your campaign, how to use that analytics to drive the next point. And going to understanding what it was. Was it the 14 year old kid? Who was it? What ad was seen? And a friend of mine sent this cartoon, cartoon and it's, it, it's so true. We come up with all these ideas and concepts. We celebrate, we celebrate that Ford ad, the creative, the one, all, all of it because you can figure the forward and the smoke. The advertising campaign gets awards. You have all these different things. You have your social information. Why did the person buy it? They were out of stock on the one they actually wanted. So there, there's a lot of information and you need to weed out as quickly as possible what's the good information, what's the bad. Try to make those analysis and go forward. September 18th, this is a few days ago. This was mind boggling for me. There's an event called the Mexico, um, which is in Germany, not Mexico, but anyway. Um, the, you have a lot of the different companies, you have the different ad tech companies, they're all coming together, showing the different things they're doing. And this announcement, CPG brands going away from demographic targeting and going towards behavioral targeting. I, I, I was stunned that this was an announcement. I was stunned to find out um, so many of these companies, especially CPNG companies, are, are focusing on demographics still and, and not behavioral targeting. Um, Avino, part of this is day party. So you understand different products are used different times of day. Avino has products that are used in the morning. They have products that are used in the, in the evening. My understanding, I do not use the Avino products, but that's my understanding. Having separate ads to target that, 7% <laughs> increase in sales. Frequency capping. Understanding you just don't want to bombard people anymore. People are tired of seeing the same ad again and again and again. Guess what? If I didn't, 
buy it the first hundred times that I saw your ad, odds are I'm still not going to buy it. So do something else. Again, um, so P&G, Chief Brand Officer, reducing annoying frequency and serving ads only when somebody is receptive. It sounds logical, but it's analytics that are finally showing that this stuff is actually working. Um, how many people have used Amazon? I've seen everyone at one time or another. And you go in and say, hey, two things happen. You bought this earlier, and I do, again, I use the Kindle, so all the time it's like, you just finished reading this book, here are some other books we want to sell you. Um, you bought something for a friend, unfortunately that's going to haunt you and they're going to use that to update your preferences for a while. If it's not interactive, you can't go in and say, hey, that's not what I'm interested in. But, um, Nespresso, I don't know if anyone but me has an espresso machine, I love these things. Great coffee. I will get an email from Nespresso with a sale and apparently I was looking at the timing. They know almost two to three days before I typically order and they will send me an email advertising a sale. Get, you know, buy 10, get two sleeves free. It's this type of marketing, advertising, understanding interest and targeting that appropriately. You also see, and here's the uh, Vino commercial, uh, the uh, Vino ads, again, nighttime, daytime. Fairly simple, that led to a 7% increase in sales. Um, weather, we talked about before, the importance of weather. Campbell's Soup used to pull in weather, or probably still does, pull in weather feeds, and when you're showing an ad, if it's really cold out, you see the tomato soup. More people, buy and consume tomato soup on cold days. Again, genius, right? <coughs> but the ads reflect that. They'll show if it's a hot day, they'll have a different message out there. They won't show the tomato soup. They'll say, have a nice day, something about energy, something. So they're very cognizant of those things. Social networking APIs, pointed information about things that are trending. Let's see, all right. So I don't know if Wi-Fi is connected to this or not. <laughs> We'll, we'll find out in a second. It's only a 15 second ad, so if it's not, listen if you can to the beginning of this. Not gonna work, all right. So what that was is a Campbell's Soup ad that talked about, it was, it was a generic ad that ran for two months about, I, I'm sure you've seen the commercial where they're talking about a storm in the background. You hear the storm report coming, and the woman's, you know, and they're saying um, schools are going to be closed for weeks, roads are going to be closed for weeks, and they're saying tomato soup, you know, um, you know, great for the storm, and goes great with a bottle of bread. And she grabs the wine as she she heads out, as she's going to be in with the kids for for <laughs> weeks on end. What Campbell's did is right before one of the storms hit, after this is already playing for two months, I think it was Jonas. They changed the over the voiceover on the ad to say Jonas. They could see what's trending, they could see what storms people are concerned about, and update their ads accordingly. They're using the analytics, they're using social APIs to make their ads more relevant to appeal to people. <laughs> Talk about recording shopping carts. Shopping carts are driven from cookies and they're both good and bad. Um, give you guys a little tip how they can be used against you. Um, shopping carts, again, online, you put stuff in there that you haven't, that you plan on purchasing, but you haven't. And a lot of people will leave it in there once they caught on, that you're not in it, that if you leave it in there, usually most often that day or the day after, you'll get the ad, same things on sale, right? So they pull that information from the cookie, they're retargeting you knowing that. Has anyone gone to the travel sites? Expedia, you're looking for flights somewhere. Then you look a day later, and the same flights you looked at, or the same hotel you looked at, cost more. They're using the same information against you. Because they know if you keep going to those sites, and you see those prices creeping up, you're more likely to quickly buy, instead of waiting, thinking that's the way it's gonna to continue to trend. If you go into your browser history, clear your cookie history, Go back to those sites, 
Now, I'm not saying this is all sites, but several of them do it. You will see the prices went back down to where you originally saw them. A little frustrating when you know some of the you know, tricks that they're using. It can work for you, it can work against you. Basic retargeting, again, here's the Ford ad that I was looking for. Fortunately, I found a generic Ford ad. Clicked on the Ford ad, I went to the Ford site. I went to look at their um, work vehicles. And then I also went to looking at finance options. Then I went, I found that on USA Today Auto. I specifically go to the auto section to find a car ad. Instead of seeing that ad, I saw this ad. It was in the exact same area, the exact same spot, but this is what I looked at. And they knew that, they tracked that information, stored it and updated it and showed me the ad. Then I went back and saw that ad. And now instead of just retargeting, they're using what's called dynamic creative optimization. What that does, you're pulling in information about the banners, about what's being advertised. You can have different what's called a call to action. Click here to save 10%, click here to save 15%. Obviously, click here to save 15%. More people are gonna click on that than the one that says 10%. But as you look at that funnel um, in the previous presentation about all the different messaging options, you find the messaging options that are getting the most interactions with, getting the most hits with, and you're playing them out, you're pulling that data in, you're doing machine learning on it, artificial intelligence to understand what is the, um, the best phrase, then I went back and saw the same ad, and now it wasn't just the financing, it was financing or get cash back. There's also, as they pull you further down the funnel, um, HR Block did this in the early example. If you went to their site multiple times, but noticed you didn't book an appointment, you didn't get to the next step, you didn't download the application, they had to start showing different ads, different messaging. Recognizing that, again, if you're seeing the same ad again and again and again, and you're not buying, you're not downloading, you need to change it. Again, it just came out this week. So I'm trying to build this presentation as also as I'm looking at the industry updates. Now I'm changing my presentation as things are coming online. Apple just announced the latest version of Safari is gonna all but eliminate third-party tracking cookies. After 24 hours, they're gonna delete the cookies. And that's gonna make retargeting that much more difficult. Again, rise to companies that are using cookie-less tracking. A couple years ago, I started a company focusing on cookie-less tracking. We had a 93% success rate to identify your device and can retarget your device without using a cookie. Um, Mark had mentioned earlier about the company Flash Talking. Sold that company to Flash Talking. Uh, I should have waited a few years now that it's relevant because it was early to the market and nobody was really using it. Now it's going to become relevant. Eh, timing, these things happen. Um, but the, eh, I was talking to some other industry experts yesterday and the belief is Chrome, Firefox are going to do the same things by the end of the year. So again, you're going to have an influx of more ad tech companies focusing on digital track, uh, cookie list tracking and retargeting. You join cookie list targeting, it's the same type of algorithms that identify a device, can identify your second device and your third device. So here's an example to tie all this together. So I finished my MBA in 2012, which is scary that that was five years ago already. Um, I received an email, assuming from the Villanova CRM system, working with this brand, for a Villanova class watch. I'm like, you know what? I'm not gonna wear a class ring, but I'd probably wear a class watch. So I clicked on the link and I went to the, the, the website and I could configure the watch I wanted. There's a couple different versions of it. Configured it, went back to it, and I was like, all right, I need to get back to work. I'll, I'll check on this later. And then that ad started following me around. So. Finally, I, I still have it on. I finally purchased the watch. It was enough of it chasing me. So looking at it from the perspective we talked about before. From the ad tech companies, CRM worked, it got to me. They retargeted with the exact ad that I configured is the ad they were advertising for and followed me around with. Creative agency made it possible for me to actually configure that watch. Publisher sold the ad, successfully showed me the ad. 
digital agency pulled all that information together, assuming, or the consultancy, depending, I'm not sure which ones were involved, and the advertiser sold the watch. Quick show of hands, that was the success, right? Yes? Thinks that was the success, sorry. Right. So what happened next? A week later, I saw the same ad. I, I didn't buy a second watch. For the next six months, I saw that ad everywhere I went. That was six months of, of wasted advertising. That, John Wanner, that was the half that was a waste. All because there was one piece of analytics that was missing, that I had bought the watch. They could have showed me other watches, other products, maybe other schools, other things for friends that I could purchase for other people. Ba I don't know, batteries. There's gotta be a, a hundred different things they could have shown me other than that same watch and the same ad. And what you also have now, some of you have seen it, a little tab on an ad. And they'll prompt you, do you want to see this ad anymore? And you can say no. And why? I already purchased it. I just don't, I'm not interested in it. Facebook does this a lot now. And that type of information annoys you less. And it's going to force you to see an ad to buy something else versus one that you weren't going to buy with anyway. A couple of quick takeaway points. Understand again where you are in the ecosystem. If you're in digital advertising, you're somewhere on that loom escape. And you understand what is your definition of success. What do you need to get to that next pace? What do you need to get make your clients happy? It is so advanced. Again, the consultancies are getting involved, so you know that's one of the things. I can say that more now that Mark left, so I can take shots at, at Accenture and Deloitte. And, but no. You know things have gotten complicated, and there's a lot of money involved when the consultancy say, hey, this is something we need to be involved with. You need, if you're gonna bring in a consultancy, or if you're gonna hire an analytics person. Uh, Karen and I were talking earlier, one of the stats I had taken out of the presentation, but is uh, bring it up again. McKinsey put a report out, as if by 2018, there's gonna be a shortage of data analyst professionals. By 140 to 190,000 positions. Karen, you said you encouraged your daughter down that path. It's probably a good move. <laughs> but there you go. Take care of mom. Um, exactly. So there's people coming out of school that understand analytics, that understand where you are in the ecosystem. You need people that understand it and really, to be honest, have a passion about it. You need to rely on them. They need to enjoy it. They need to see what's going on. Emphasis on data quality. Again, this is one of the driving points that I, I try to make in every organization I'm with, put whatever you need to, to make sure your data is as accurate as can be. Um, one of the agencies I was with sent out bad data for marketing mixed modeling to a modeling company. And we had to pay for them to rerun that modeling because we gave them bad data. The bigger issue with that, your advertisers need to trust you. They need to understand when they realize it was bad data coming in or data that was missing or incomplete data sets, it reflects, but it doesn't matter who it was in the ecosystem, that's gonna reflect poorly on you. No such thing as set it and forget it. Um, a lot of the machine learning, a lot of the things that you can do with the data is amazing. A lot of it still needs human optimization to go back to it. Um, I, I like machine learning better than artificial intelligence because I always think of, of, of Skynet um, taking over or um, as a person of interest when it's all identifying the criminals. You're not going to have artificial intelligence taking over retargeting ads. But it is about machine learning, trying to get that information, trying to understand it and get it as accurate as it can be. And you're only going to do that if you're constantly revisiting your models, making sure that they're accurate in what you're doing. Um, again, understanding your definition of success, where you're trying to go, and overall the power of analytics. The, the, there's a reason there's, there's so many jobs that are in this area, because people are relying on it. 
It's also a great area. Being on the MC and uh, agency and ad tech side, people come out of school that have done analytics and get a job in that area. These companies are relying on it. You can have training in how to do these regression sets and get up and running. It also is a great way to understand <coughs> the different industries because all these different industries that we talk about all day today are all being driven from analytics. New companies coming up, like Mark's focusing on analytics and different ways to look at it, taking traditional things. How many times have you seen something online and you're like, oh, so obvious, like I should have done that. You know, that, that's so obvious that we could have done that online instead of the traditional way of doing it. Saves so much money, but again, it's all being driven by analytics. Questions? Thoughts? Concerns? Interesting anecdotes? Yes. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, My pleasure. Uh, so obviously, some frustration or uh, challenges with uh, browsers going cookieless. Um, cost aside, do you see uh, these cost device solutions at them or in its current state above, uh, in terms of efficiency? Uh, I'm biased, so I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, yes, and it's, it's part of my frustration in, in coming up with that idea for that company and working with two partners and then scrapping it because we couldn't get anyone interested in it. We knew it was coming, but we just people were like, wow, this is really great, but you know what, people are still using cookies. Um, and we weren't the first company to do it. We, it was like one of those concepts of, here's how we could do it better than others are doing it. So there's been multiple companies out of it in the same frustration. Um, trying to find out other ways to do that same technology. The reality is the technology has been out there for a while. Now the need is there for it. And I think what's going to happen is companies like Flash Talking that have this technology embedded, that have been working on it for years, that are working on improving it. To be honest, when I was involved with it in the prototype, our accuracy was not 93%. In fact, one of my partners is working at Flash Talking now. Part of the Again, you had the machine learning, you can't set it and forget it. They're part of what got it to 93%. Companies that are ahead of the curve like that, that are trying for this, will be able to handle that and retarget. So they'll have, in my opinion, an advantage before the other companies catch up. Is that 93%? Is that like a mix of probabilistic and deterministic? Or to, to come up with a 93% or to determine it was 93%? To come up with 93%. It was a combination. Um, it was more deterministic. Um, to be honest, the probabilistic is on the uh, cross device side. That's in that you're really making an educated guess. There are cheats, if you will. Um, it, you download an application on your phone, and then you, the first thing you do is connect with it. And you can create a login or use your Facebook login, right? Isn't that one of the immediate prompts? Every time you use, you're doing those types of logins, is on your phone, and we can target those. If you're Facebook and you want to target a, a mobile user, well, you can find the, the Facebook ID on it. So there, there's cheats. I shouldn't say cheats, but there's ways to do the deterministic side. So it's really a combination of that. And I'll tell you a little cheat: how we found out it was 93%, or how we were able to determine how accurate it was. We use cookies. This, the cookie was already on it. We didn't use it to make the decision, but then we could look back on the, to say, hey, there's a cookie. Did we get it right? And it was a great way to test. Um, there, there was other ways we did to determine what yeah. Anyone else? Questions? I've been trying to time this as I saw them setting up lawn shows. I'm trying. Good.